legislation, their hopes of a medal for Father Capon became a reality this afternoon. President Obama presented the award to Capon's nephew in a ceremony in the East Room of the White House. Father Capon has been called a shepherd in combat boots. His fellow soldiers who felt his grace and his mercy called him a saint, a blessing from God. Today we bestow another title on him, recipient of our nation's highest military decoration, the Medal of Honor. In the chaos, dodging bullets and explosions, Father Capon raced between foxholes, out past the front lines, and into no man's land, dragging the wounded to safety. When his commanders ordered an evacuation, he chose to stay, gathering the injured, tending to their wounds. When the enemy broke through and the combat was hand to hand, he carried on comforting the injured and the dying, offering some measure of peace as they left this earth. When enemy forces bore down, it seemed like the end, that these wounded Americans, more than a dozen of them, would be gunned down. But Father Capon spotted a wounded Chinese officer. He pleaded with this Chinese officer and convinced him to call out to his fellow Chinese. The shooting stopped and they negotiated a safe surrender, saving those American lives. Then, as Father Capon was being led away, he saw another American, wounded, unable to walk, laying in a ditch, defenseless. An enemy soldier was standing over him, rifle aimed at his head, ready to shoot. And Father Capon marched over and pushed the enemy soldier aside. And then, as the soldier watched, stunned, Father Capon carried that wounded American away. This is the valor we honor today. An American soldier who didn't fire a gun, but who wielded the mightiest weapon of all. A love for his brothers, so pure that he was willing to die so that they might live. In the camps that winter, deep in the valley, men could freeze to death in their sleep. Father Capon offered them his own clothes. Their bodies were ravaged by dysentery. He grabbed some rocks, pounded metal into pots, and boiled clean water. They lived in filth. He washed their clothes, and he cleansed their wounds. The guards ridiculed his devotion to his Savior and the Almighty. They took his clothes and made him stand in the freezing cold for hours, yet he never lost his faith. If anything, it only grew stronger. Father Capon's life, uh, I think, is a testimony to the human spirit, uh, the power of faith, uh, and reminds us of the good that we can do each and every day, regardless of the most difficult of circumstances. President Obama awarding the Medal of Honor to Father Emil Capon more than 60 years after his death as a prisoner in the Korean War. Again, the major developments of the day. The full U.S. Senate officially took up gun control after supporters swept aside efforts by some Republicans to block debate. A spring storm system unleashed tornadoes in several states, killing at least one person in Mississippi. And President Obama urged North Korea to end its belligerent approach. Meanwhile, a new intelligence report found that it is likely that the North can mount nuclear warheads on missiles. Are the personal choices we make contributing to economic inequality in the U.S.? Ari Srinivasan has more on our online coverage. Economic historian Jerry Muller argues that your financial fate could be determined by your mate and your family. Read his argument on Making Sense. Plus, singles who prefer to date within their own religion are capitalizing on niche online communities to find love. And on our health page, new data on global obesity rates offer a glimmer of hope. Find a comparison between the U.S. and other nations. All that and more is on our website, newshour.pbs.org. Jeff? And that's the News Hour for tonight. I'm Jeffrey Brown. And I'm Judy Woodruff. We'll see you online and again here tomorrow evening with Mark Shields and David Brooks, among others. Thank you and good night. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by...
announcements unless somebody else wanted to. Did you ever go to this wall? Yeah. yeah, I know it's working on it. She said, oh, that's bad. the City Council meeting. We're very happy that you are here and we're very happy that people are at home watching us tonight. First item of business is the roll call, please. Councilmember Norton. Here. Councilmember Story. Here. Councilmember Bator. Here. Councilmember Termini. Here. Mayor Harlan. Here. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Is Janet here tonight? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Please come up, Janet. Uh, one dessert over the line. <laughs> right. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Let's face this way. We have a camera on us, and thousands watch at home. We're. Um, this is Janet Blazer. And we are so proud of her and all of her work over many years and that you're a Capitola resident. Mm -hmm. Whereas Janet Blazer was a longtime volunteer with Project Scout, which has been providing free tax assistance for 30 years to senior citizens, individuals with a disability, and low-income residents in our community. Whereas Project Scout brought in more than $1.5 million in tax refunds to those individuals last year alone. Whereas Janet not only volunteered as a tax preparer, but also dependably served the Project Scout Board of Directors for many years. Whereas Janet was instrumental in facilitating the 2003 merger between Project Scout and the Seniors Council, providing long-term stability to the Project Scout operations. Whereas programs of the Seniors Council facilitate over 250,000 hours of volunteer service, Whereas the Internal Revenue Service computes the value of those volunteer hours at over $5.7 million. Whereas Janet served, joined the Seniors Council Board of Directors in 2003 and has ably contributed to the coordination of the Seniors Council volunteers for over a decade. Whereas Janet donated her fiscal expertise to the Seniors Council Board by serving on the Finance Committee and Janet also acted as the liaison between the Seniors Council Board and the Area Agency on Aging Advisory Council. Janet's patient, intelligent support made her a loyal volunteer and a valued resident of Capitola for over 15 years. Now, therefore, I, Stephanie Harlan, Mayor of the City of Capitola, on behalf of the entire City Council and the entire city, do hereby acknowledge and ex extend appreciation to you for your service to the community. Thank you very much. I'm just absolutely overwhelmed and I thank you. I enjoyed every minute of the volunteering. Uh, I figured I was giving, getting more than I was gi giving. It just seems like I did so little. You did so much. You did so much. Well, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would any other members of the audience like to speak and thank her also? Come on up, Clay. Clay. Come, up here, yeah. Come up here, since we're facing that way. This is Clay Kemp, the Executive Director of the Seniors Council. 
I, I just want to add how instrumental Janet's been in our success and really in the merger of Scout and the Seniors Council. Without her, that wouldn't have happened, and Project Scout probably wouldn't exist today. And the you know millions of dollars of returns that the Scout volunteers prepare would be a thing of the past. So thank you for my brain and for my heart for all you've done. I really appreciate it. Welcome. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. Come back to a council meeting again sometime. With, give us your thoughts on, on what we're working on. We want your advice. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is David here? Come on up, David. <coughs> I'm so thrilled you could be here tonight. So am I. I'm, I missed your reading at La Selva Beach uh, Library. I wanted to go to hear you again because I loved your poem last year and I loved having you here last year. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. David Swanger is the um, Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz County. And many probably don't know that we have one, but we do. We have a lot of talented poets in Santa Cruz County. And uh, we're so thrilled you could be here tonight. I'm designating April as the National Poetry Month for us. The Academy of Poets established the month of April as National Poetry Month in 1996. The National Poetry Month is now the largest literary celebration in the world. <clears throat> the legacy and ongoing achievement of American poets is extraordinary. <clears throat> Poetry is an essential part of the arts and humanities and inspires artists in other fields such as music, theater, film, dance, and the visual arts. The Capitola City Council celebrates <clears throat> the beauty of language and the vistas of imagination poetry creates, acknowledges the importance of poetry in education, and appreciates that poetry can enhance our understanding of ourselves and our appreciation of others. The City Council takes pride in Capitola's diverse, accomplished poets, as well as appreciating the panoply of readings, festivals, and literature that vilify vivify the city's cultural life. I'm sorry. <clears throat> a commemoration <clears throat> like National Poetry Month encourages our re recognition and enjoyment of poetry. Therefore, I now declare April 1st through April 30th as the 17th annual National Poetry Month. I call upon public officials, educators, librarians, and all of us in Capitola to observe this month through our ongoing enjoyment and support of poetry. And I'm very happy to congratulate all the poets in this community. <clears throat> and I just wanted to tell you a quick personal story. <clears throat> a long time ago, I was an English teacher, and as part of that, taught poetry. And had the students write poetry, the boys and the girls. And the boys were, you know, oh, I don't want to write a poem. But, you know, that's not a guy kind of thing to do. <clears throat> and we entered our poems in a local contest in Watsonville that was sponsored by the Women's Club, or I can't remember who it was. And two of my, stu my male students won. Mm -hmm. So I had to take them to this tea at the Watsonville Women's Club to receive their awards. And they were sort of mortified and didn't want to go. And I said, we have to go. You're getting an award. And then they were so thrilled. They were really qu very talented writers and very talented poets. And mm -hmm. so I'm really happy that I could help in that way and open their vistas a little bit. And, and um, love, to, love to hear from you now. You were a terrific teacher then. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, Okay, I'm honored to be here, and I love being the Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz County. Uh, I go around at this month to the various city councils and to the Board of Supervisors. I don't know where else this would happen that I'd be welcomed, so I'm honored. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes here, and I'll read two poems. One of them is a poem that I wrote when, my, uh, when I first became a father, and the other is a poet that I wrote specifically for you guys, all of you. And so um, that's what I will do. And as I say, I'm honored. And thank you. You're welcome. Stephanie. Can we hold the microphone while you read? Would you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This one is called My Daughter's Morning. My daughter's morning streams over me like a gang of butterflies. As I, sour mouthed and not ready for the accidents I expect of my day, greet her early. Her sparkle is as the edge of new ice on leafed pools, while I am soggy, tepid, old toast. Yet I am the first version of later princes. For all my blear and bluish jowl, I am welcomed as though the plastic bottle I hold were a torch, 
and my robe, not balding Terry. For her I bring the day, warm milk, new diaper, escapades. She lowers all bridges and sings to me most beautifully in her own language while I fumble with safety pins. I am not made young by my daughter's mornings. I age relentlessly, yet I am made to marvel at the durability of newness and the beauty of my new one. Thank you. And this one um, is out off the press. So <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope it's comprehensible and enjoyable. And I honor the supervisors, and I honor civic government, and I try to honor those who uh, are willingly give themselves to this exceedingly difficult task of helping us to be more civil and to be more poetic and loving. And so I wrote this, and it takes up the issues of water and homelessness and things of that sort, as well as beauty. Board of Supervisors. I feel like I should turn around and address them, but then I won't be on the camera. Is that right? Well, you can be. You can speak there if you like, because the camera will, t will turn. May there I? you go. Okay. The best of both worlds. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Madame Mayor, do I, do I take this with me? Or, uh, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors goes home after a long meeting and tries to sleep. The Board of Supervisors lies in the long dark and tries to think of nothing. But nothing is elsewhere doing what nothing does which is to fill the dark with something. It is not quite enough to have swept the sidewalks, to have heard the river shudder and stall where it meets the bay. And what of the persons and the way they got from there to here, wanton, wanting what we all have? The supervisors dream they are at a toll booth, digging in pockets for the right change. Who can change at 20? Who has directions? Where should we go? Morning birds flute. The meeting room, once more, full of light. A new day, they will do it again. Account for the water and civic order. Gather at the ground of their making and make something out of all the causes, slowly growing the synapses of our ever incomplete republic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> so that's David Swanger, and if you see him doing a reading locally, I'd encourage you to go listen to a reading because he writes beautiful, beautiful poetry. The next item is the report on closed session, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, all council members were present for closed session, which occurred at approximately 6 o'clock. The council discussed all of the items listed on the regular agenda as well as the special closed, ses closed session agenda, but took no reportable action. Thank you very much. Next item is additions and deletions to the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions? Staff has no changes. Okay. Next item is public comments. This is a time for people to talk to us about any item that is not on the agenda. If it's on the agenda, please wait till we get to that item and you're welcome to speak then. Would anyone like to come up? You have three minutes. Good evening. Hello. I thought I would use a different name tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all wouldn't know who I was. That's sort of witness protection. Yes, uh-huh. I think I need it. I'm Sandy Erickson and I live here in Capitola and I want to commend y'all for what you're doing with our proposition or our measure O money. You've hired three employees. I hear you're going to pave a lot and uh, probably going to buy some new parking meters and I have not seen one piece of slurry go on a street anywhere. So I just uh, wanted to call that to your attention and let you know that the folks are watching. And so uh, uh, 
I would encourage you to do and to take interest in the city and the things that matter to the people who live here, not the things that matter just to the tourists who come here. So thank you for your attention and allowing me to say that. Thanks. The parking meter is not going to, parking lot is not going to use measured own money. <clears throat> That's going to be general fund money. Right, but it's still money that the city is obligated for. So. Okay, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak? <coughs> staff comments for okay, staff department. comments. <coughs> Thank you very much. Right Public Works Director Steve Jesper. Good evening, Council. <coughs> um, I'm here to report on we had a bid opening uh, yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning on uh, removing the last of the coaches from the Pacific Cove Mobile Home Park. We received eight bids. The S engineer's estimate was $99,700. Um, wide variety of bids, but the low bid, luckily, was at $42,416. And bids went all the way up to $155,000. So quite a spread. So Chris Wartman Excavation is the low bidder. Uh, we will be moving forward to uh, get him signed under a contract and get him moving. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions about that? I have a question for Steve. Sure, Steve. Steve, um, I know that the, the slowly grinding wheels of government are in fact paving our streets as we speak. We just don't see anything yet. But what's the status of the proposed project? You are actually at the April 28th or 27th. Next council meeting, we will be coming forward with authorization to go out to bid on the uh, Measure O money that we received this year. Thank you. Okay, other <coughs> staff announcements? Council announcements. I'll call the council's attention to the lovely artwork. I believe it's <coughs> from the middle school um, that is adorning the walls of the chambers. We put in new art hanging uh, devices to gallery hang these. We'll be changing them probably on a monthly basis, thanks to Lisa Murphy and Kelly Barreto. Uh, also, we'll be bringing to you in the next, either the next meeting or the meeting after, the new kiosk of the village that you tentatively approved a few council me meetings ago. The artist came to see us on Tuesday night and with the clay model of the bronze otter for the top of it, and it's absolutely amazing. So well done, and you'll be excited when you see this. Thank you. Ed, do you have any? I do not. Sam, do you have any? Yeah. Do you have any items? I have a couple. <coughs> um, the museum is having its grand opening Saturday at 11 a.m. They have a new exhibit. It's fabulous as always, and I encourage you to come down Saturday for Cake and Punch. It'll be open also f on Sunday, and then usually it's open Friday, Saturday, Sunday <coughs> from 12 to 4. So come in anytime. <coughs> they, <al coughs> excuse me. they also have a number of really interesting videos that you can watch. One that Brad McDonald donated from home movies from the 50s. And it's a lot of fun to watch Capitola in 1950. Some of it's changed, and some of it hasn't very much. But it's a really fun video that they'll put on the television for you. <coughs> Last week, I attended the graduation, went along with uh, Chief Escalante, the graduation of the men and women in the community recovery services programs, inpatient and outpatient, of the Santa Cruz Community Counseling Center. And it was very powerful, very exciting, Wonderful to see that these people have graduated from these programs, are moving on in their lives, and it's a whole new beginning, and it was just fabulous. The um, Mayor's Select Committee met yesterday, the Mayor's Manager's Meeting, and we're going to invite Deanna Sesams, our staff person for the League of California Cities, to our next meeting to give us an update on some of the League's legislative concerns, actions, so forth. We get emails from her about those. And one of the issues is that the League was disappointed to learn that Sacramento County Superior Court Judge had issued an opinion Monday, March 18th, denying the League's petition challenging the constitutionality of the legislature's decision to fund the criminal justice realignment program in part with vehicle license fee revenues. These funds had been previously allocated to cities on an unrestricted basis. So now they're being grabbed away, another instant of that. So we'll talk about that then and where that is. There is a Senate Bill 405 that um, I got a letter about that will follow. 
and it is regards um, to um, single use carry out shopping bags and it's state legislation and the, the, the question is does it preempt will it preempt local ordinances and it fails to clarify preemption and thereby my note says that it opens the door to litigation against cities and counties and we've worked so hard everybody's worked so hard on their ordinances and are so and are comfortable with it that if the state comes down with something else we're going to have to change it perhaps so I want to follow that <clears throat> and um, I brought up um, the need to have some long-term planning to review needs for seniors in our community the baby boomers are all turning 60 65 now and we're going to have this huge population with a huge number of needs for uh, transportation and meals and congregate care facilities and independent living facilities and um, all sorts of things that that you know a lot of we're not really addressing very well in our planning or in our program support and the seniors council did give us a, a little <coughs> while ago a, um, the senior needs assessment and so I'd like the uh, mayor's managers meeting as a group to address those things so that we can kind of coordinate efforts we don't have the RDA funds so we don't have the money to help out with some of these housing projects that would be wonderful for us but um, anyway we I just would like us to start thinking about it and trying to plan wherever we can so that we don't find people that are um, going to have to move out of Capitola because they don't have any services or facilities or assistance here I'd like to invite the community to participate in the annual 10th annual garage sale on Saturday April 20th all day long and you can register it has to be by April 18th and you can sign up on our website which I won't give you you can just look up city of Capitola on your on your computer and if you have any questions you can call Lisa Murphy at City Hall and she can help you with it she coordinates it every year we put out a map and a list of all the garage sales so you can stay right here in Capitola and go to your neighbors garage garages for their garage sale and uh, have your own garage sale and get rid of stuff and it's a wonderful community event I'd also like to invite the community to Paradise Beach Grill on next Thursday the 18th at 6 o'clock there's an organization called Operation Surf that brings wounded soldiers from Houston Army Hospital to Santa Cruz County to have surf lessons and after their surf lessons it's going to start they'll be here from April 14th to the 18th part of them are going to have lunch and dinner in Santa Cruz and part of them will have dinner here in Capitola and Paradise Beach Grill is hosting them but it's open to the public and the more the merrier and um, I'll be handing out some proclamations to the the soldiers that come after having hopefully a wonderful experience in the water and in Santa Cruz and in Capitola so you're all invited to come probably call and make a reservation ahead of time and that's all okay the next item is the consent calendar these are items that are relatively minor um, and in nature and we take them as one action unless anyone would like to from the audience would like to pull it for separate discussion or a council would like to pull it for separate discussion but anyone from the audience like to us to pull up an item for separate discussion would council like to I'll move the consent calendar second I, I'd like to pull um, item a for discussion and it can be put at the end of the agenda if possible okay okay we have a motion in a second any discussion or questions I, I have one question on regarding um, item item C on the consent agenda and I can if I could do sure why, let's do that now okay um, for years uh, the junior guards of Capitola have been tied to the lifeguard program and almost close to 100 percent of the lifeguards the cities has hired over the years has been graduates from that junior guards program it's kind of a, a, a stepping stone for kids to step into positions with um, uh, that trade and now we have the city of Santa Cruz taking this over do we have any priorities to uh, kids who go through the junior guards program here in Capitola or is there any is there still any connection with with uh, the the lifeguard program to our junior guards program uh, Madam Mayor Councilmember uh, Norton the there hasn't been a formal path from the junior guard program to our lifeguard program in the past it's true that many lifeguards did come from the Capitola Guard program and um, I, that, that path is still open to them. Almost all of our 
former lifeguards transitioned over to employment with the city of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we did this transition was that there was sort of greater career advancement opportunities beyond lifeguarding with the operation within the uh, Santa Cruz uh, Fire Department, which is where they house it, and also greater, greater training opportunities. There is included in this contract um, a relationship between the Junior Guard Program and the Lifeguard Program in that the, the Lifeguard uh, Training um, Program, there's a required um, beach safety training that our Junior Guard instructors receive, and that training will be provided by the City of Santa Cruz Lifeguards uh, as part of this overall contract. I, I just like through the years, if we stay with this program, that we don't don't lose that connection. It's been a very, very effective uh, means of education and water safety and, and, and introduction to the ocean through our junior guards program. I just want to make sure that continues, and it continues because there's there's actually um, uh, uh, this model or ideal person <coughs> out there who is a lifeguard out there to, to look at, look onto, and so. Um, Without a doubt, the skills that the, the, the children pick up in the Junior Guard program work very, very well for lifeguards. And in fact, our, our highest level, um, our highest level uh, participants are uh, are, junior, are effectively lifeguards. And in fact, we do end up paying some of them to help uh, run the Junior Guard program and continue to participate. So there's a real nice opportunity for advancement within the program. And as you point out, that the skills learned uh, in Junior Guards are directly transferable to lifeguards down the road. Thank you, Jimmy. And hopefully it would be considered in their application if they put that on there as, as one of their uh, experiences that they were a Capitol Junior Guard, that, that that would stand out on the application. Okay, then we have a motion to uh, approve all of them except for A. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The next item is the public hearings, 9A, presentation by Superintendent Castaneda. Superintendent of Soquel Union Elementary School District. That's a rarity. <laughs> Welcome, Superintendent. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Harlan, good uh, members of the council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. As mentioned, I am the Superintendent uh, Henry Castano of Soquel School District. I'd like to talk to you about our local funding measure that we are proposing. We have a campaign taking place today. This measure is based on where the future of education is going. This measure is based on what our children will look at in the 21st century. This, isn't, this measure is not like same-o, same-o. We're not a district that's going to stay the same. But to be able to compete competitively, globally, our children's education has to change. I think this sums it up, and I will go through this presentation when you look at essentially this quote. Our children are far different than when we went to school. Society today is demanding children to be very global in nature and being able to stand, understand how society is taking place. And you talk about an innovative society that is taking place globally. That's the real world today. And that's what all schools need to change, just not Santa Cruz County. I'm going to play with, this is, I'm going to. Right arrow. Right arrow. Is the one on? Uh -huh. uh, did it move? Mm -hmm. It did. Oh, hold on. So that's a soft. I think this is, if you read Thomas Friedman, and Thomas Friedman talks about economic society, I truly believe economy plays a major part in what life is all about. Friedman is talking about we must change how we educate our children, and that is a very important for our future. And looking at how our children will be able to look at what they see tomorrow and be able to build on that. There are no limits children have. The only limitations is their opportunities and also the structure of the schools. If you look at this, this is our district and this is what's comprised of. We have three elementary schools and one middle school. They're all doing very well. They're all good schools, but they're not great schools. To be a great school, you have to have complete different ideologies and looking at can you educate kids outside the classrooms? Can you engage with the private sector and bring the private sector in together? Can you make sure that there's continuity that exists so that the city as you all, and we have done uh, pro uh, projects with you, can they engage seamlessly? And how do they incorporate the entire community? How do we work with the colleges? Innovation, this is what we've been working on, and this measure, actually Measure S, is a two-year project. We ta started talking about a local funding measure last year because we looked at the limitations of funds that exist in the district through the state and what's allocated to our district. We also looked at what our vision would be in the next three to five years. 
So we have spent two years looking at, with the leadership team, at the different trainings that have taken place and the different requirements for their training. We do take a very half-and-half uh, half private sector model. We do have to believe in accountability, and we do believe in the structure. We, d we have taken this uh, statement, and it's probably is our mantra. We do believe that you have to be unwavering. You have to be committed, and you have to have compassion and progressiveness and being able to address some really complicated issues. It's hard to educate all children, and this is what we need to talk about. We need to talk about what they call the brutal facts. We do educate very well in this county, the top 20 percent, but not all kids are all educated very well. When you look at this, this is working with Cabrillo College. We started a program two years ago to bring in Cabrillo College and UCSC into our district. And as working with students for college, this is what they're telling us for the future of our children, what is taking place. We know the children will have to be highly educated to survive. It's no longer acceptable that you can think you survive in the 21st century with a minimal education. Economics plays a big role in your quality of life. This is what's taking place today, and this is why I've come to you for asking for your endorsement support. Today, when you look at what children are actually taking for the high school, A through G classes will get you involved to be able to qualify for state and universities and private institutions. If you do not take A through G classes and not do well in A G classes, you are not going to be accepted to these uh, colleges. And as you well know, the competition to get into college right now is brutal. And the only way children are going to have opportunities to compete, they have to be highly educated. I'm not saying everyone has to go to college, but I, do, I, I am uh, stating it is in our best interest to highly educate all children. This is also what we're working on with Cabrillo right now. And one of the things is the reality of why articulation is so important with the colleges and the high school district, and we are articulating with, articulation with the high school district. Today, 90% of students who go to Cabrillo College need remediation work in either math or English. That's unacceptable. This is the breakdown, what is taking place for our other institutions of education. If you look at UC, still 25% of the freshman class coming in will need some kind of remedial work. 57% of your CSUs will need some kind of remedial work, and this is what's taking place at Cabrillo. And we are, we are looking at how to address these challenges. As I said, all the school districts in, in Santa Cruz County now are working with Cabrillo, and now we're working with UCSC and building programs for students in that alignment, and also looking at our assessments and how to align our curriculum. I think this is what really what education is all about. And if you look at the goals of uh, what we need to do for our children, we need our children to be highly more uh, engaged in their curriculum. We need opportunities where students are doing more what I call project-based project learning. We need the opportunity to have students get away from our schools and also involved in the communities at large. We also need to be sure that we offer the 21st century in technology that doesn't exist almost in this entire county throughout every district. This is what we're doing today. As I said, we started this project last year. We have made a major impact to our journalism class and what is taking place in our journalism class. We're requiring kids to do global uh, editorials and writing about what is taking place in the world that's important to them. Uh, we wrote a grant and received a grant for almost $150,000 to incorporate last year to build upon what children should be receiving. This should be common in every classroom. This should be the standard in every school district in Santa Cruz County, but it is not because funding is so uh, depleted and our state has done very poorly in making education a priority. This is what we started and it launched last year and this year this program has grown Fivefold. Our robotics program at New Bryant Middle School is, is dynamic. And what's really exciting is we're bringing into the, this is the 21st century, what the education program should be. You're reading about STEM everywhere, and you're reading about how Silicon Valley involves STEM education. It's science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And that's the real world. That's why school is so different than when we went to school. We can do a number of things. The real world now requires children to be proficient in all those areas, to be able to be competitive, and also be able to get in, into the higher levels of education. I think this is where we have come to you and asked for your support. We do believe public education is for the common good. 
we do believe by high, having highly educated students and being productive students that the city of Capitol is going to flourish. We also know home values could continue to rise with high, high schools where have high test scores and schools that are highly uh, sought after. Our, well, the good news is our enrollment is growing because we are building programs and we're building programs parents want. But at the same time, it's a seamless connection and that's why we seek your support. With the city, the city should be involved in schools. That's the highest value because your future leaders are going to come from these schools. And we are, as you know, our proposition is Measure S. And it's a mail-in campaign only. Uh, the campaign will, will, election day is May 7th. Uh, citizens have received their ballot in the mail only this week. So you're, everyone is uh, going forward with that. Uh, this is regarding the stable and local funding. This measure gives us an opportunity. It's for eight years. It's $90. It gives us an opportunity not to have to wait. We're sitting here in April. We still don't even know our budget for next year because the state hasn't passed a budget and usually doesn't pass a budget to probably June if we're lucky. But yet all our program commitments for people, as you have commitments for people, by March 15th, those commitments have to be made. So this funding measure, all the money stays in the district and it goes for set programs that we have established in our ballot. We will have a mandatory accountability system and you will see that. There will be a citizen oversight committee and the citizen oversight committee will have all the information they need for the budget, where the allocation has gone, where the money has gone and it's a year to year process. And the money can only be spent on the ballot language that was written. We, we worked hard. Um, we went out and made presentations to the senior coalition and received their endorsement. It was about a 45 minute presentation. The presentation was very good because I felt the members of the coalition, they were highly involved in their schools. They, under, they had a firm understanding the connection between high quality schools and quality of life in our city. Also as we listen, they offered us opportunities to say, would you be willing to change things on the exemption forms to make it easier for citizens? We said absolutely yes. They said, would you make it so that a citizen could sign one time and that signature for exemption would be good for eight years? We said yes. They asked us, can they sh just show one piece of ID instead of three or four pieces of ID to show that they are a citizen? We also said yes. And we also agreed with the citizen uh, coalition that we will bring, we will make a presentation to them so that we can get the word out and publicize how easy it is <coughs> to receive an exemption. We also put the form on our website so seniors now can go to our website, click in. Uh, we had a se senior citizen today come in and he asked for an exemption. We said absolutely. And then we actually made 10 extra copies and we said give them to your friends who are out there so they don't have to all drive to this, uh, the district. So we are working very closely with our citizens. We value them. We believe schools belong to our community. We believe our buildings belong to community. There is no reason why our community should not be using our, our buildings in after hours. And we talked about with the senior coalition to bring senior coalitions and work, having them work on the technology area so they can learn how to do Facebook and that they also can learn how to email loved ones and actually develop that relationship because that's what schools should be. Schools belong and schools are part of what the community is all about. And, and that's it for my formal presentation. I do believe this is the future and, and the future is going to be living in a very demanding world that we hope all of them could be successful. And it's by our seamless working together, we are uh, looking forward to that joint partnership. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Would other people like to speak? You might just sit in the front where we might sure. have some questions for you. Absolutely. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, Council, my name is Tori Del Favro, and I am a product of the Soquel Union Elementary School District. And now I have the pleasure to send my children there, and I'm also a trustee on the school board. And I want to thank you all for individually endorsing Measure S. As a parent that volunteers and actively fundraises, for this school district and for my children's school, 
I see how far we have gone down in the last couple of years just with some changes in the budget from the state level. We no longer have class size reduction. We have children in classes that are 32 kids. We have to move seats around just so the kids can move around and go to circle time. We bring in pencils. We bring in tape. We volunteer for everything. We help pay for music, the library, the art programs, and we're willing to continue to do that. But we have hit a point where we can no longer bake sail our way out of the problems that our district is facing to stay competitive. So I ask the council to endorse Measure S because I think it's fantastic for our community and for our children to keep our community strong, keep our kids smart, and keep them educated. That's what we all want. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there other, other people that would like to speak? This looks like a troublemaker. Good evening. <laughs> pull, the, pull the microphone down so you can speak right into it. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Ruby Story, and I live here in Capitola, and I'm in third grade. Um, and I endorse Measure S so we can have better classrooms and help our teachers and help other students like me. Thank you very much. Very good. Very, very good. Um, good evening, Mayor Harlan and council members. Um, I'm Helen Yoon Story, and I'm also a Capitola resident and, of course, a parent and a school volunteer as well. Um, and I also want to thank you all for personally endorsing Measure S. I really appreciate that support. Um, and I hope that you take that step tonight to, uh, to endorse it as a council. Um, being so close to the state of education locally, um, as we are as a family, as parents, um, we really see the effect that the state budget cuts have, have taken in our classrooms the last few years. And what I really like about Measure S, it's a local solution. You know, there's local control over the funding, oversight, that ability for seniors to exempt out. I think there's a lot of thoughtful aspects to the measure, and, um, and I'm just very excited about what it can do for our schools and for our children in terms of, as our superintendent said, really preparing them for um, where education needs to go, where they need to be for the workforce and for additional um, education as they go forward. So um, really appreciate and, and hope that you support the measure as a council tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. I'm Barbara Venner. I am a uh, resident of Soquel. I am a volunteer and have been so for about two years at one of the schools that we are talking about. And I am against this measure. I volunteer in a classroom of 31 students. I grew up went to a private school that had 35 students in that class. I did very well in school, graduated from college. I have a daughter who went on. I, I, I don't see any problem with that, and I don't see those problems in the school I'm in. Um, I wasn't real clear on what they're going to do with this money. I'd like to know how it's actually going to affect the classroom that I'm in uh, helping, and also, I would like um, Mr. Castaneda to go to the Senior Coalition again and talk to those people because I'm kind of an enigma at that school. I'm the only senior. I don't have any children in that school. I just like to be around children and I like to help. I have no grandchildren, so I get my kid fix at school. And I love it. I really enjoy it. Um, but. I think there should be more seniors helping out. Our population uh, demographic is growing um, tremendously uh, with seniors, not children. <laughs> the children's population is not growing so fast, and I think we need to employ those seniors. They'll volunteer. As you know, you just commended a, a volunteer lady that was helping. Uh, they'll volunteer in the schools and help out. And. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very computer literate if you're talking about technology, and there's a lot of seniors who are, and they can help in that area too, especially in the elementary schools. So um, I, I don't see raising the taxes. I don't want to throw my neighbors under the bus. Even though I can be exempt, I don't think it's right that we raise this tax. There's already five 
um, bonds on my tax bill that I get every year, uh, twice a year I pay uh, those bonds that are for the SoCal School District. So I think one more is not necessary. I think we can tighten our belts in certain places and still get by. Thank you for your time. Thanks for speaking. <clears throat> Would anyone else like to speak? Good evening. Hi. Hi, my name is Wendy Young. This is my son Colby. He goes to SoCal Elementary School. And I have a first grader and a future cougar who will be there in a few years. And I just wanted to say we love SoCal Elementary. I'm so proud to have my kids there. And I'm so glad that all of you have individually endorsed Measure S. And I wanted to back what Tori and Helen said. Um, and then expand on that a little bit is, you know, in our particular situation, you know, as far as fundraising goes, um, and tightening our belts uh, as one of the people who raises money through the home and school club it's gotten to a point where you know we're asking our parents for so much money and as as much as we've tightened our belts we're paying for the library this year and our individual librarian is volunteering extra time to make it an even better place for our kids I mean we just have people bending over backwards to volunteer to help our kids and it still isn't enough we support an art program we pay for part of our music program um, we're bringing all the supply you know like as Tori was saying we're bringing in pencils and Kleenex and uh, it's you know having 32 kids in the classroom you know it's I can't say that my children's education is suffering. They're getting a wonderful education. But I can also say that last year when my child had 22 people, 22 children in her kindergarten class, it did make a difference. And when they're trying to read and they're trying to get individual one-on-one -on -one time with that teacher or even volunteers, having 10 extra kids makes a huge difference. So we would love to have this pass, and we would love your endorsement, and thank you for your support. Thanks for coming tonight. Would anyone else like to speak? Good evening. Well, I've got a timer here now, huh? <laughs> Good evening, uh, council members, uh, Mayor Harlan. I'm Ted Donnelly. <clears throat> um, I would like to also personally thank you for your endorsement for uh, Measure S. Um, where should I start? I, I was once on the, on the board for our district. And sitting on the board for almost nine years, we saw dwindling funding. I really don't think we, the uh, public schools actually get the respect from the state that it should. We get propositions passed. People think we're going to get a large sum of money. We don't. Just propositions are being passed to protect funding. And the way the state gets around with funding is that they lift the restrictions on restricted funds. So somehow the district is pull, pulling money from different funds within the district. So it's not worth getting more money for other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Measure S is, will go towards the classrooms. Yes, I grew up in a, in, when I grew up, we had 33 kids in the classroom, was pre-proposition 13, which funded. We had a huge amount of funding for the classes back then. Proposition 13 passed in 1978, saw a lot of dwindling and just dwindling in funding, <clears throat> and it will affect the students. Our, our educators work very hard. I can attest to that. I have a daughter who goes to UCLA. Thanks to SoCal Elementary School District for that. Um, and for her, actually she had a scholarship to UCLA. And uh, SoCal Elementary School District prepared her SoCal High School prepared her, and she's on doing wonderful things. Uh, so Measure S is going to help um, continue the quality of education that uh, we need the support for, and then also the parents need the support for, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else like to speak? Henry? Oh, go ahead. Good evening. Hello. I don't know what name I'll use this time. Um, I think everybody in this room is fully aware of what it takes to go to school and to get educated because we've all done it. I think Mr. Castaneda has a slick presentation. 
I was surprised to see that he left out the part that he included at the Chamber of Commerce that said that only 10% of all the kids who apply at Cabrillo College now can read and write well enough to get into the, to college and do the work. The school system has been failing for probably his entire teaching or educational career. And what they're proposing to do now is to layer more money on an already failing system. He has some nice glitzy slides, he has some good ideas, and I agree that education needs to change. The problem is they are piling our money on, an, on a failing set of tenured teachers, uh, non-classified unionized employees, and none of that is going to change. When a mother can take a curriculum and educate a child at home to be more successful than our expensive educational program is, then we have a real problem. And the fact that nobody wants to address that issue is very, uh, it's very disheartening to all of us who are looking at, some, at a form of government with their hand out all the time. This may be only $90, but it'll be over $200 for the Soquel Union School District on every parcel. And I think that uh, the school district has gotten front page coverage above the fold in every publication in this town. And the people who are not supportive of this, you know, we play the Dickens trying to get somebody to listen and they don't. There is more support for this than you might imagine. And I think that it is terrible for you to think that senior citizens have so little integrity that we would all run out and vote to raise everybody else's taxes. But that seems to be the prevailing idea at all levels of government these days. I would urge every senior citizen to apply for the exemption because they are going to waste your money because they're not making any fundamental changes. You got, they got the 10% uh, sales tax increase, uh, or we got Proposition 30 that increases the sales tax for schools. And they want us to think that this school board is more reliable than the state government. You are all the same to all of us who are not part of it, who only see you waste our money all the time. So I would urge everybody to not vote for this until they come up with some fundamental changes. No teacher should have a lifetime job. You should be able to make sure that you're getting your money's worth for what you've got. And I don't see any fundamental changes to that. We got a preschool that the state voted not to have. And I know there were some slick ways to get the money to do it, and they will tell you that they don't staff it, but they built it and they maintain it. They've got a nice multi-purpose room at New Brighton School that I walk by all the time, and they have a new office for the principal. There is no obvious improvement to any of the teaching facilities that, you can, that is visible from the street for that school. And yet here they are asking for more money. And I just hope that people will listen. I know that the pro-school crowd is quite vocal and vehement because they've knocked on doors. There's 10 little signs around that say no on S. And people have banged on their doors and gotten in their face and say, how dare you do this? And it's not that we don't support schools and we don't support parents. What we don't support is having our money wasted on a failing system. We don't support a glitzy superintendent running around trying to sell us like a preacher who needs a new building. So I would urge everyone at home, to, I know my time is up. It's too bad you didn't schedule a presentation for the opposed side. And I, it sounds to me like all of you have individually supported that, which is your right. But I would hope that you would not commit the city to saying that you support a failing system without fundamental change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak? Good evening. Good evening, <coughs> Madam Mayor <coughs> and Council. Uh, my name is Caroline Miller. I have a daughter at Main Street Elementary. And I just wanted to try to end on a positive note tonight about, uh, of course, I'm for Measure S. I've been volunteering on the, the campaign. And my wish is for really to reduce the class sizes. Uh, again, yes, we have great teachers and great schools. We just want them to be 
even better. And the thing with the 30 plus students in the classrooms is that there's a lot of different needs. We've got special needs children, we've got English learners, so it's more difficult for one teacher to address all those situations. And for volunteering, um, yes, we do have volunteers and we would love to have more, but it's just not, it's not a guaranteed thing. Um, it seems like a few do the volunteering for everything. So it's the, the weight is on just a few of the people's shoulders. So with the tax, yes, unfortunately, if it does pass, people will have to pay for it that don't want to, but we do know that through polling, there's a 78% positive um, opinion with the community, and that and that's that's democracy. We get to vote on it. <laughs> um, so, I just thank you for your time, and I support Measure S. Thanks for coming tonight. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay, I'll close the public portion. And Henry, why don't you come up? We might have some, Superintendent Henry, we might have some questions for you. Are there questions? Can I have some questions? Yeah, thank you, Henry, for your presentation. Um, I did want to ask, uh, and it was actually brought up by one of the other speakers, uh, about maybe the, the specific plans for the use of the Measure S funds. Uh, and particularly, I mean, you did address, um, you know, really the challenges that the school system has in educating our youth in this modern society. It's more complicated, there's more technology, there's more that uh, kids have to know and learn. Um, how exactly, and I know that there are some generic uh, uh, core areas that are mentioned, but are there thoughts about the particular uh, curriculum improvements, classroom reductions, or the introduction of technologies that uh, has been considered? Absolutely. That's a very good question. Thank you, Councilman. One, one of the areas that you've heard the speakers talk about is class size reduction. We, from a year ago, our class sizes have increased K2 50%. We're, we're approximately at 22 to 1. Our classes now are sitting at almost 30 to 32 to 1 K2. The immediate influx of money will be $500,000 for K2 reduction. It's very expensive to have small class sizes, but at the same time, the impact to the children is essential. Children today, and all research will show you this, regardless of what school district you're in in the state, if children today are not on grade level by third grade, the opportunities are minimal that they will be on grade level. The infusion of this money for Measure Rest is impacting K2, and that's 500000 We're also putting another $150,000 will go into for library assistance or library, what they call specialists, and also in the area of technology. We have to put technology into the schools, and our program is looking at K2 major influx of money next year, if this measure passes, 3-5 the following year, and then 6-8. So there's a progression longevity plan already established for this measure. And the area is also in math, because I mentioned math is a gateway to college. We are looking at how do we can maintain our math programs. We have some very advanced math programs. We have geometry at the middle school. It's rare that a middle school will have geometry, and that's where we're going to continue. But the reason we have, we have great teachers. We had smaller class sizes a year ago, and we're trying to re reinforce those. Councilman Story. All right. Thank you. Can I have one follow-up question? And um, there was also a reference to the um, Citizens Oversight Committee. I was wondering if um, the uh, members of that committee have been selected, uh, who they may be, uh, and if the council were to endorse the measure, whether the city of Capitola would uh, have a seat on the Oversight Committee. We are more than open to having a, a member of the council on that seat. We approached, the, when we, uh, we approached the senior coalition, uh, we asked them also if they would have sent us a representative for the Citizen Oversight Committee. Uh, we want broad representation because we want the word out that the money that's invested for the future that for our children is well being spent. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions? Henry. I might. Um, are there any, uh, and I'm, I'm reflecting concerns that our constituency has brought to us, then their concern is that this money will be used to replace a general fund expenditures now being made, freeing them up 
for other purposes. You understand what I'm saying? A, a money sure. swap where it Absolutely. comes in. I'd like you to address that if you could. Yeah, uh, that is actually not taking place. Uh, if Measure S does not, if we're not successful, and remember it's a supermajority, it's very difficult to, to pass this kind of measure. We will not reduce our class sizes next year. We do not have the funding to reduce class sizes. So if this measure does not pass, our kinder classes will be there. They will be right now our ratio is 29 to 1. But having 29 to 1, that's how you get to 32 to 1. So that will not occur because that's $500,000 that we do not have in our general fund. Uh, so we would have to look at that. Uh, and then when you talked about the the library assistant and the tech person, there's only funding for one year. If Measure S does not, is not successful, that also will be removed. So no, this is not in the general fund. Uh, Measure S is sus actually sustaining these programs that we used to have. Also, I think a few years ago we went through a, a cycle where there was a class reduction program that went into effect. It seemed to be good. It seemed to drop it down and forgive my memory, it's probably eight or nine years. Um, and then it creeps back up again, and I'm worried because I'm a, I'm a big proponent of small class sizes. I've seen what it can do, and yet I see us reduce class sizes, and then as money becomes tight again, they creep back up, and 32 seems to be the number they, it always seems to go to. How do you not make re a reduction in class size, but keep a reduction in class size? Uh, that's also a good question. I'll follow up that on Councilman. Uh, the question. We guaranteed our, our, our constituents, and that's the community at large in Sap Capitola, so Cal School District, that if Measure S passes, class size reduction will stay at a minimum of eight years. We are not, that's our number one priority, reinstate small class sizes. So that number of 32 will not occur at all in K2. And um, also Measure S does, as Councilman Tamini mentioned, if Measure S does pass, it does give us opportunities, other options to use some funding that we never had opportunities to use before, and that is correct. So that em embraces the cl small class size, the math programs, also embraces the technology. And, and no district in the county, and remember I come from Silicon Valley, no district in the county has even addressed what the new Common Core is going to do and the demands on technology and the requirements on technology. Our children are different, and that's why the environment has to be different. And, Superintendent, um, simple math tells me that if you're going to reduce class sizes, you're going to need to add teachers and add classrooms. Physically, do you have classrooms to be able to add? And that's a good follow-up question. Yes, we do. We will be adding 10 teachers if Measure S passes, and we're excited about it. We already are doing our preliminary designs. We are doing our structures. Yesterday, I was meeting with the principals, and they're looking at their grade configurations. So we're actually doing two blueprints right now. So if you were all principals, you would actually look at your staffing, and then you reduce your classes K2 to 22 to 24 to 1, and then you would draw them a map, and you say, I need X number of teachers. We already know exactly how many teachers we have to hire and what classrooms and what schools they have to hire. And we're doing that now. I understand that part. And we, have, we actually have the rooms because we had them last year. Okay, so yeah. you do have the physical classes to fill with new teachers and reduce the class sizes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Ed, I have a couple of questions because um, we've gotten uh, some emails and calls about this from people that have some concerns about this and um, do you have the ballot language with you? Does anyone have it here that we could look at? Because there, people are afraid you're going to use it for other things and I know you say in there it won't be used for anything else. Correct. The, ball I, the ballot measure, I don't have the ballot itself, but the ballot measure clearly stipulates the areas and there I think there are seven areas that where the money can be utilized. We have a copy. Thank you. Could you read that part please? Sure could. Okay, here are the areas where the money can be utilized. Protect core academic programs in reading, writing, math, and science. That's what I was talking about, STEM. Maintain advanced math, science, and other courses for high-performing students. They're talking about geometry at the middle school, the journalism. Attract and retain highly qualified teachers. Support smaller class sizes. Retain 
school libraries and librarians. Maintain art, music programs and keep schools safe and clean. These are the only areas that money from Measure S can be utilized and appropriate for each year. Would you be willing to write us a note um, and say that you're not going to use it for Jade Street Park? Because that's what people are concerned about is that you're going to divert the money. I, I, absolutely. It's, it's, first of all, I'd be breaking the law, which I wouldn't do. And second of all, I'm more than happy to write a letter. Okay. And this, the, actually, this is, I'm going to follow up on a question earlier. Uh, we would welcome a council member, also the Citizen uh, Oversight Committee. That is their charge because their charge will be they will receive this ballot language and saying how has that money been spent. And how long is the oversight committee going to be in existence? Eight years. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and how do people find out about the exemptions? We have done a number of things for the exemptions. Uh, this is also working with the senior coalition. We s mentioned that we will attend a meeting after uh, Measure S uh, is successful and we will use their contacts to get the information out to our senior committees. We will also attend uh, large gatherings where seniors gather for either meetings or they have uh, social groups. We also have it on our website where you can download the forms. How and also in the newspaper we will pay uh, seniors can uh, request an exemption form. And what's the time period for requesting the exemption? Uh, I, I, we don't actually, we never put a limit on it. So um, if the, after May 8th and someone came to us uh, less than, uh, because remember you collect taxes, uh, but we don't have a cutoff date. So there, it's pretty open when someone can request an exemption. Okay. And um, do you, have you been doing telephone calling now? Are you using children to make these telephone calls? Uh, we are used, I, I know there's of a student, I've seen only one student, yes we are making phone calls. Uh, we're making phone calls every evening. The um, question is are you using students to make phone calls because someone mentioned it to me that that was not legal. Well it act actually is legal. We, I know a student who has a high interest in government at the middle school and I know he's done a superb job of volunteering his time. He's not getting any classroom credit. Now that's where you get in trouble, where your teacher encourages you to do community work and all of a sudden you're doing community work for a local measure. We would not accept that. That's not acceptable. So a minor is allowed to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Who pays for that? The, I don't know. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that next. Um, I think all of the activities that you're, you've, you've listed there are very much needed and so forth. People just uh, are not comfortable with a new tax and they're not comfortable with um, the way it's run, I guess, and some of the things in the school and that's why they want to see some balance here. If they're going to give you more money, what are you going to do and, and so forth. So I understand, I understand both sides very well. And, and I'd like to comment on, I, I agree. I think schools have to be very accountable. I think they're ha I'm an outcomes person. I'm a results person. I'm not a person that just believes programs for, for essentially campaign issues. There has to be a direct correlation to what your investment is to your outcomes and to your productivity. And that's the difference in our district. Yeah. We're taking that attitude now. And you didn't want to save money by putting it on in the next available election? I know that costs money too, but it might cost less. But the question, and that's a very good question, if we delayed uh, this election, we would not receive the money for two years. That's two generations of kids that would lose completely class size reduction. And there's no guarantee if we delay just because uh, it, it's a bit cheaper. And a bit cheaper is less than $20,000. You don't want to delay two years for less than $20,000 for an investment because the difference is, and as you well know, if you're in the private sector, once you build your corporation, you develop your strategies for outcomes, productivity, and everything else, once you stop and reorganizing, which we had unfortunately have taken a pause on to reinstate the programs, you, it takes a lot more money and a lot more time. Yeah. Another, another concern I had expressed to me was that the state might take away money when you get new money, and they said that that happened when the lottery was first started, that the lottery was, was billed as a supplement, and yet the money was taken away from the schools uh, that, because they were receiving this new money. I don't remember whether that was the case or not. That no, that was not the case. Um, this will not happen. Um, this is a local funding measure. This money is, is totally separate from any formula from the state. This is the beauty of having a local funding measure because it's totally controlled by citizens of the community as well as the board members. 
other questions, Dennis? Yeah, um, I read in the Sentinel yesterday where um, Santa Cruz County uh, has a 90% high school graduation rate. I think that's fantastic. I mean, that's a reflection all the way down back to you guys. And while well, the state average, I think right now, is 76%. So we're 15, 17 points above the rest of the state. And so the education system must be doing something right in this area. Um, uh, a real disconnect to me is the federal government and immigration laws that we're talking about now where they're, they're talking about loosening requirements for um, uh, educated people coming up. And, and the disconnect to me is, is why aren't those people being produced locally? Why isn't it? And, 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 and um, looking at the actions of the state of California particularly as regards to their, their attitude towards, towards education is just that it's really lacking. And I think you are taking the right action. I don't think you can wait for the state of California to come, come forward with money for you. I think you have to go to the electorate and, and, and an educated community like Capitola or Santa Cruz County that appreciates um, education. And I think you're doing the right thing by doing this. And so I'm supportive of what you're doing. I've, I've personally endorsed that. I, I have a question to the council in, in that um, we really haven't taken positions like this in the past on measures, or very seldom have we. And whether it's the right thing, uh, all of us individually have endorsed um, this measure. And is it the right thing as a, as a council to, to make an endorsement um, with the council's name? So. I have another question. One, uh, one, another concern that someone brought up to me was that, that people from out of the district can transfer in, but yet they're not paying for it. They're not paying any extra. They're not being, having this extra additional tax to help pay for all these. So, so the people here in, the, in this district in Capitol and Soquel are going to be paying for um, this, these extra services and so forth too. I don't know. Maybe it's not that many people that transfer in, so it's, it doesn't, you know, it's not that big of an expense. But it was just the, sort of the concept of it. Okay. Let me respond to that, Ben. Uh, I'll come back from the business model again. The dynamics in uh, building a great district. Remember, we're a good district. Santa Cruz County has good districts. They don't have great districts. We don't believe right now we can compete globally with all our students. We don't believe now that we're being innovative with STEM. We don't believe now that we're being seamless and working with the universities. You asked about the question about students coming into our district. We want students to come in our district because we're a revenue district. That means we get paid for the number of students who are in our district. Other districts, I've come from a district where we're basic aid. We're receiving $11,000 per kid. In SoCal School District, we're receiving 5800 The discrepancy in California, and Councilman <coughs> Norton, you mentioned it, discrepancy in California when it comes to public education is an atrocity. Our kids have to compete. And as council members, I've only worked with council members that fully endorse schools because they know the productivity of schools is the productivity of the, of the city of, of Capitola and your future. And it has to be seamless because you can't have a disconnect. Your biggest value is your students. And that goes, and now the district is working from preschool to at UCSC. That's the first time we've been ever do that. And this is what's turning in Capitola for us now. And this is the, why we've come for your endorsement. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll close the you yeah, have question. Have one more question. Yeah. Okay. Actually, a question for the city attorney. Um, if, if we've taken the position, I know I did when I endorsed this measure as a, a city councilman, are we being redundant by approving it? If we've all endorsed it, not, not as citizens, but as council people, is it redundant to do it as a collective action? No, not at all, because you've, you've uh, already endorsed it as a local citizen, and you would be endorsing it as a body and as a city. What I'm saying is I endorsed it as a councilman. Okay, there's a title, but in the, in the publication that's out there, it says Ed Bodorf, Capital City Council. It wasn't... St still, you would not be redundant. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I thank you for your time. Close the public hearing. One last question, Sandy. Well, you said you would ask him who paid for this. Who paid for the, who paid for the brochure that she's holding up? Probably the Citizens Committee. No, that came, we have, and, and, and that's a good question, and, and I do publications twice yearly, and that's part of from the superintendent. That's the message. Because right now, only 17% of the population has students in our school district who are, citizen, who are citizens throughout Capitola and SoCal. And they should know how their money is being spent and how, how successful we are being with our students. So 
as a superintendent, that's one of my responsibilities of publicizing the success of our students. Okay. It's a fine line there between information and, and politics, and I'm sure that you stayed on the right side of that line, hopefully. I haven't seen the, bro I haven't seen the brochure. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Okay. Would anyone like to start first? Mike. Um, just a quick note regarding the, the buildings at New Brighton and uh, other schools in the district. I sat on the Citizens Oversight Committee for that particular bond for many years. Um, and I can assure you that the visible construction looks like a new principal's office. The bulk of the money went into actual classroom renovations and upgrades to schools that hadn't been touched in a long time, which also begs the question, why hadn't they been, had been touched for a long time from the general fund money? Another, another argument. I, I started out on this particular measure before I endorsed it, being at best ambivalent about it and not wanting to come out in favor or opposed to it because I had serious concerns. Uh, I finally came to the point where I felt that my frustration was misplaced. My frustration was with the board and with the superintendent. And whenever you misplace your frustration, it ultimately falls to the children. Uh, and I have begged the school district to always think of the children and not think politically or be frustrated with the city council. And I was doing the same thing that I was being critical of them of. Um, there, is, there are no school districts that are islands. There are no cities that are islands. There are no counties or states that are islands. We are um, sentenced to live with the students we educate. We have no choice but to live with the children that we raise. Not just our children, everyone's children. So it is our responsibility, and we can't make this an argument about whether the state gives us money or doesn't give us money, because the bottom line is we have to do the best we possibly can. Um, and by the way, the county council did rule on this particular measure. They must use it for the items that they listed it for. And they all, the school district, I believe, also has the ability to decline the parcel tax money should it cause a reduction in state or federal funding. Am I correct on that, Henry? A nod is good? Okay. Um, so I'm going to be in favor of this, even though I question the city as a body doing it just like as Councilmember Norton did, because I did it personally. Um, I, the, only, the only thing I want to leave with is I would like to see the same spirit of cooperation from the school district after they're successful with Measure S as they hope to gain from the city of Capitola before the passage of Measure S. Back to you. Sam, you want to go next? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I will go next. And I think it is a, appropriate for the uh, council as a body uh, to actually hear all the uh, vibrant discussion about education and how we support it um, and where we may feel that it's not serving our needs uh, uh, today. Um, and um, But I, I think the reason why it's important for the council uh, to consider and rule on it because it has a direct impact upon a significant part of the residents of Capitola and whether or not you have children uh, that go to that school district um, um, that you know the children are our future generations uh, they are the, um, the the people that are going to be sitting up here uh, in another generation but it also gives us the ability to make a stipulation that the city council be represented on this oversight committee and that way we have a direct link and we can participate um, and have an ongoing dialogue and oversight uh, on how uh, the Measure S funds are made and I would hope that if this is approved that we would uh, request for that particular stipulation. But going to the measure itself, I mean uh, certainly yes, we don't like taxes. Um, they are a burden on us. Um, but I don't, of all the taxes we pay, it seems to me that this is the one that has the most direct return on the investment and particularly for the homeowner. Because aside from the arguments in the ballots that I read, 
there is a direct correlation between your home value and the quality of the school in your neighborhood. We hear it over and over again. People want to go to neighborhoods. They want to buy homes in neighborhoods that have the best quality schools. And what does that do? That drives up home values. And so to me, that is a direct connect. This $720, $90 a year for eight years, um, $720, that, only, that equates to um, a little more than one-tenth of one percent of a $500,000 home value. Uh, so to me, there is clear return on the investment, even if you're just looking at it from a number standpoint, <laughs> not regarding uh, really the, the educational quality of our youth. I don't think it serves any purpose to, um, you know, to be referring to our school system as failing systems. Um, they are struggling because they are dealing with all the challenges um, of, of, of a society um, that we present to them. They have to do it day in and day out. I think that we have to acknowledge the hardworking teachers and administrators that um, teach and work with our children of all degrees of abilities and home conditions um, uh, that come to them. Um, and I think for the most part they do an admirable job, but they need help. And I think that we can give it to them um, through supporting Measure S. And the last point I want to make, because there was also a mention made about um, that a mother at home can educate their child just as well as uh, a teacher in a classroom of 30. And that very well may be the case that homeschooling has that quality. But I would submit to you that that homeschooling is the ultimate classroom size reduction because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And what if we had that for all of our kids in the classrooms? That is what we should be ultimately striving for that's why homeschooling is successful uh, without regard to anything else. And so um, I would just like to submit that and, and I would support and, and encourage the council to um, pass a motion supporting Measure S. Thank you. Who would like to speak next? Ed? Sure. Um, you know, it, we went through this a while ago with, with Measure O and, and there's no doubt that the dollars are tight. Um, I, the thing I, I look forward to is is the concern that you know if we don't take the steps now to educate our kids and what I'm worried about here is you know I, I too went to classroom sizes of 30 and 31 and you know what I what I want to explain is that I think times are different now especially just demographics uh, the importance of kids getting left behind or getting lost not getting that special care attention they need it creates a bigger burden for us down the road. These become, these children become liabilities for us and end up costing us more to a city. So it's the, the, the concept or the intent of putting money into education, especially at this early age, K2, you know, making the classes, this is great. This is what we need. And this is the positive step. Um, you know, as we got behind Measure O, you know, and, 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 and like the time will tell when this comes out, this money is gonna go back into the city. And I'm going to say you just need to be patient and you need to watch. And then I guarantee it, if it doesn't go back in there, we'll hear about it. But I think there needs to be, like, like Mike mentioned, you know, there's a different uh, attitude in the school district, different representation. This money is going to go back into their account. This isn't money that's going to get lost someplace else. Uh, and I support this measure because it's going in the right direction. Yes. Um, I'll move that the Capital City Council support uh, endorsing Measure S for the Santa Cruz, uh, excuse me, for the Capitol of SoCal. I'll, I'll second it, and my comments okay. are that um, besides being an English teacher, and I was a music teacher for many years, and I was laid off in 78 from a job, and it was awful. It was awful. They said, well, music and art can be handled by, by the parents, by volunteers. And so I really want the schools to be in wonderful shape. I want the supplies to be there. I want the experiences to be there. I want field trips to be there. I want us to provide the best education we have for 
all the kids because they deserve it. And as other speakers said, we want to have be proud of our schools in town because people will come here and because of the schools. And it's been really unfair what's been happening to the schools. And um, we can all have some concerns about about different things, but uh, they need the money, and I'm happy to support them and um, hope that the music and art the art program is fabulous there. I'm, I'm more familiar with that than the music, but um, and and we have to give credit to the teachers that are struggling because they don't have what they need. They don't have enough supplies and um, they need things for their kids in the classrooms. And they need, class size reduction is, is very important. You cannot teach effectively when you have 40 kids in the classroom or 35 kids in the classroom or 32 kids in the classroom. I've been through all of that. And you, you, the kids have such a much better experience when that's, the classes are smaller. It's just crazy to walk out into a classroom and see you know, 40 faces looking at you and 38 faces looking at you. You can't get a, be effective. So I really support it also and thank you all for doing what you can in this respect. If I may, may add a friendly amendment to the motion that, um, that uh, the, um, we request that uh, Capitola City Council have a seat on the Citizens Oversight Committee. That's fine with the second. No problem. All right. Any other thank changes, you. comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. Okay, item 9B, consideration of the Lower Pacific Cove parking lot project financing and village pay station deployment. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Let's give them just a minute to leave. Okay. And good evening. Uh, at our last city council meeting on March 28th, the city council uh, heard a report on uh, the Lower Pacific Cove parking lot project. Um, the scope of that work was approved at that meeting, but the funding was continued because um, the staff was asked to look at increasing the loan that we'll be applying for for that project to see if we could. Uh, eliminate all the single space meters, uh, parking meters uh, that the city has in its jurisdiction. So staff went back and looked at um, where we have single space meters and this map is my best depiction of such a large area and what I'd like to do is kind of go through our thought processes that we looked at and our recommendations. So just to orient, we're here, the city hall is right here. Villages down here, Cliff Drive, the wharf. Anyway, um, what we have between City Hall and Stockton Avenue are parallel parking spaces. Uh, that means there's one every about, about 22 feet. In the village where we already have uh, pay stations, which is outlined in red here, <coughs> we have diagonal parking spaces, which means about three every 20 feet. So. Um, the parking density is much greater than <laughs> due to the cost of the pay stations at about $15,000 a piece, using them where there's parallel parking becomes quite cost, cost prohibitive. So we, we've kind of gone through and looked at where we have parallel parking, where we have uh, diagonal parking, and um, there's a couple areas where we think we can get it even though we have parallel parking in, in the um, city and then some areas where we're going to recommend that we continue with uh, single space meters, although we will be recommending a change there. So I'll kind of work our way around. On the Monterey Avenue, we have parallel parking, but by relocating one meter to the corner, the boy, southwest corner of uh, Monterey and Capitol Ave and then buying one new meter, we think we can service um, I think there's about 20 uh, parking spaces in here. We're also going to be relocating another meter that's currently on San Jose Avenue to uh, this corner. That will not enable us to service these six parallel parking spots on Capitola Avenue uh, with pay stations. Um, the idea with pay stations is you want to get one within 75 feet of every parking spot. Um, we then get into some distances of long parallel 
parking. Um, we could service these six um, parallel spots here. It would take another pay station. We're trying to get one in ten. So our recommendation was we stick at this time with uh, single space meters and also in this area. Um, even though there are 20 odd uh, single space or uh, parking spaces in this area, it would take three pay stations to get within 75 feet of each one of those parking spaces, even with crossing the street. So it's just, it, again, it's the cost. What were, there are six up here, opposite City Hall, and those are right across the street here. And our recommendation is we do a, a pilot program there where we replace the single space meters that are there with ones that accept credit cards and also coins. They will also be available to use pay by cell phone on those. That's kind of a trial. If that's successful, we see implementing that in a lot of these other areas. Um, the cover that the areas we do on Cliff Drive, um, parking density up here is pretty great. Like we have 10 spaces here. We have 12 spaces here and over 40 spaces here. We think those would be beneficial to use pay stations in those areas. Um, the last area is the area along the wharf. There's actually eight parking spaces in here. Um, it's very spread out and um, there are all, there's five real close in this area, but three that kind of spread it out and our recommendation is to get, um, go to the single space meters there. What we're thinking is we will do a trial here. If they're successful, which we fully expect, then in these other remote areas we will come back um, once we've gotten the bugs worked out of these uh, single space credit card meters and put them in here. It would be possible that in these areas right here from the trestle down through San Jose Avenue um, that to go to pay stations uh, in the future uh, and we're, as we discuss the meter rates in the village and the meter areas in the village, if the meter areas are expanded at all, it may work to put pay stations in there. So we're recommending the purchase of five new pay stations that will service Lower Monterey Avenue and Cliff Drive, authorization to proceed with a six uh, space trial with uh, pay credit card single space meters and the rest we're deferring decision on to make sure that the, these meters work or that there's any expansion of the meter areas. The next map, I just want to show you how we're, there's two meters that are getting relocated. I thought I'd show you where we're taking these yellow dots and moving them to the red dots here so that we can service this area. This is part, part of our original plan. We knew we were kind of uh, oversaturating these two areas in here specifically and that was our plan. They'll still have the meters uh, within the required distances and allow us to serve this and this meter will also help us serve these areas. So again, um, looking at the financing, it's our recommendation that we do not increase the iBank loan at this problem at this time, which is what our uh, application is for the Lower Pacific Cove parking lot. Uh, we're, rec we're requesting authorization to submit a $1.37 million application that will just focus on uh, the Pacific Cove parking lots. And we are recommending that the uh, budget amendment be done transferring $78,000 from the general fund unassigned fund balance to purchase five new pay stations and ultimately six new single space meters that accept coins and credit cards. That's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions before I open to the public? Steve, our, our iBank loan covers pay stations in the upper and lower Pacific Cove, correct? That's correct. So we will have no longer have parking meters in the upper Pacific Cove parking lot. That's true. Gone. One Gone. Point. Okay. That's my only question. Dennis. Um, when we started into this pay station thing, um, I, I think we were first assured by the company that was put in and our information was is that we were going to see um, approx approximately a 30 percent revenue increase for putting this type of system in. And to date, we've seen no increase. We're, we're paying, we're, our income for, that we're taking in right now is exactly the same or pr pretty close the same as when we had parking meters through the whole village. So the thing that I see here is the investment in and hopefully a long-term thing. We haven't lost any employees. We have the same number of employees. The, our costs are the same. And now we're talking about taking um, money and expanding, it, expanding the system. Now, I think what I have to be convinced is, is not a, we can't accept this as a revenue generator because we've never proven to do that. 
But what I'd be, I need to be convinced is the fact that you're, you're, you need some way to reduce the, the labor force that, that, that it acts as, number one. Number two is, is that we have a system that's going to last us a long time. Because we have a major investment right now in what we put in here above what it costs us before to run it. So we made an investment in, in under the pretense that we were going to make more revenue. I know there's some complications with this in the fact that we, we haven't worked out the credit card thing and we're getting charged on that. But still, it's a reality that we're not making any money, more money today than we were when we had the regular parking meter system. So could you respond a little bit, Steve, what, what you think? Is this something long-term for us that will make it easier? Or what are yeah, we I think, excuse me, I think a big part of it is, is service to our visitors and residents who want to go park. I mean, when we were at $1.50 an hour in the village mm -hmm. and uh, had to pay by coins, it was difficult and there was a big demand on the businesses. So I think a, a big portion of it is a public service. I do think there has been a small increase, probably not the 30 to 50 percent we were expecting, but I think there, we have realized about a 20 percent increase in the revenues and the meters since we've gone to the pay stations in the village. Um, yes, there's some problems. I think everybody's having problems with the technology and, and, and the cell service in the village, but I think the company has been very diligent in working through those and making them operate successfully down there. Um, I think we will see a savings in the amount of labor we have, especially back here where we're replacing 232 parking meters with pay stations. Um, right now, you could probably go up there and 10 of those meters aren't working. Um, and if they're not working, there's no revenue generated from them. If a pay station goes down, there's, there's redundancy there that they can pay at another pay station. So I, I think we will see more of an increase here um, as we move forward. Uh, so the long-term investment, I think, you know, you'll see more and more of these pay stations and parking banks uh, in every jurisdiction going away from single space meters where you can economically do it. I think the public's getting used to uh, expecting them and, and ease of use is something, a big bonus for them. So I, I think uh, I, it's obviously a better system. There's no question about that. The question is, is that there's economics that we have to plan to this and plus we made, we made a major investment that we, some, how we need to see a return on that we made in, in putting the system in place. And right now we don't have that mechanism in place. We don't have any. We don't see at this point where it's increased our revenue to pay for pay for the system that we put in there. Um, so, and, and are we anticipating that the labor force for uh, for for taking care of this program will reduce, Jamie? Is this or does it stay the same? Does it require the same number of people to manage it as it did before? We have been able to reduce some of our maintenance contracts. I'd let the police chief chime in here, but uh, I know that, that the, the meters take a significant amount of effort to keep up and running in the coin collections. And while you do have to collect coins out of the pay stations, number one is, is they can store a lot more money in them. Number two is it's a lot fewer locations. Uh, and number three, they don't break down as often. So we, we, there is a staff savings. We, some of it was done on a contract basis, and those contracts have been cut out of our budget, so you are seeing a savings there. Uh, and the chief can uh, elaborate on that if there's anything I missed. Uh, yes, I can. Thank you, city manager, and uh, good evening, council members. The pay stations are actually uh, more efficient in the way that if there is a problem at the pay station, it sends a text alert to our parking meter people so that they can come down and repair it right away. If it's a hardware issue, it'll only take a couple of minutes. If it's a software issue, we can contact our, our company and they can do that over uh, the internet. They, they can repair the problem there. If it's a meter problem, it's going to take five to ten minutes once we get notified of the meter problem. That's usually if somebody leaves a note or they stop down at the department and let us know there's a problem with the meter. Uh, the pay by phone option is helpful in that if you're down at the beach and you, you want to add time, you can do that over your phone. And rather than having to walk up the stairwell and go back to your car and with quarters, so. Will we be able to get uh, pay by, oh, Chief, you might want to also add that uh, we removed one coin machine from the village, saving us hundreds of dollars a month, and now we're going to remove another one from up above, saving us hundreds of dollars a month in contract in our coin collection service. Is that true? Yeah, at each location, the service, it's about $350 a month, which includes another $58, I think it is, for a fuel service charge. So, I mean, we, we will look at other options. I think we're still going to need coins because there's some meters out that we're going to have to provide that service. But we will definitely take a look at what we can do as an option. And, Steve, 
um, the pay by phone, especially smartphone, you know, like Park Mobile, things like that, are we going to be able to have our pay stations accept that as well? Yes, we will. That's great. And that's a service that doesn't cost the city anything. The customers pay when they use their cell phone to pay. Right. There's a surcharge added on. It does not cost the city anything to implement it. I've even heard of customers who start a pay phone app, and then they go home, and when they're in bed, their cell phone tells them they've been paying for parking downtown Santa Cruz all night. So I speak from experience. Okay, <laughs> okay this is a... I just had one question. Okay, one quick sure. question. Steve, I'm trying to go back to my uh, parking uh, commission days, and I thought that the, uh, the the promise of profit on this was about 20 percent, and I thought we had conversations that we were seeing 17 percent. Is any of that valid, or is that am I just imagining this? I I, I thought it was in the 30 to 50 is what other it, it jurisdictions had seen. We probably um, came back from that a little, but we are right, you know, as you said, 17, 20 percent somewhere in there. Okay. Other questions? This is a public hearing. Who would like to speak on this exciting issue of parking meters in the village? Oh. Good evening. Hello. Since I got up and came down here, I want to thank you for saying, so far we're not seeing any savings, and asking the question, are we going to see any labor savings from that? I'm glad somebody's thinking about it, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Sure. I'd like I'm gonna, to. I'm going to close the public hearing. Oh, okay. Let's I'd like to move the uh, public staff hearing is closed. Moving the staff recommendation over here. Motion. I, I still have st discussion second it? before. No, I don't. Not yet. I'll I, second I it for discussion okay. purposes. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. Um, I would like to see um, some type of accounting system that we see on a regular basis of this whole parking program investments. Um, being that we are eventually going to turn to the point where creating parking, we're actually going to be able to sell off parking, that we have some accountability of, of whether the system economically is working. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously the city <laughs> gets great revenue overall from, from parking meters or from that parking program. There's not a question about that. But, but um, I, I think some direct accountability and some accounting of this whole system and our investments in it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, number two is is that um, in using the 78,000 that we're getting back into the general fund, um, you know, I, I don't think that this is an urgency thing here we're doing here, but I do think that that um, the community really wants to see us hot on this paving program. I think we have a better place to put the 78,000 than we do in to put it into a parking program for for people visiting here. I mean, th they can live with what they have now. It's not a bad system that's out there, and we can live with the way it is now, and we can we could talk about that after after the uh, um, after the uh, the budget hearings, is, you know, when we see what our true economic situation. But I think this 78,000, if we're getting back and back in the next month, I think it goes to good use if we can let Steve expand the, the paving program back in the community and show them that we're we're out there doing these things. Um, number three is, um, and this relates a little bit differently to this, and. Um, Myself and little Jamie's help, I did a little um, financial packaging on what the lower Pacific Cove is costing us by itself. Not right now, we, in the past we talked about it, what it does to the general fund and what, what the repercussions are there. I'd like to pass this on to all of you. Thank you. Is there one extra there? There is coming back. back, back. Mm. And so, um, I was just looking at the economic figures of Lower Pacific Cove, and I'm not talking the project down. I'm just saying what the realities are and what it's costing us. And and um, we're looking at an I bank round loan of somewhere around 88,000, and then we're getting to back out um, the shuttle parking lot. That's a that's a reality. That's 5,000 a year that we're saving there, reducing storage costs is a obvious 5,000. In, in the previous financing, we've always seen the 2.39 million loan from Santa Cruz County Bank, but it really has nothing to do with Pacific Cove. It should never have been in that whole category because that's not a revenue source. That's just a reduced reduction of, of debt. And then the one thing that was truly left out of there was what it costs us every year to maintain that lockdown there. And you start looking at all the things that we're adding in there, including um, 
the bathrooms, the cleaning, which is on a daily basis, the lighting, the sewer, the landscaping maintenance, the sweeping, the parking meters, parking meter maintenance. It, it really comes in out around, I would think, close to 20,000 a year is what we're putting in that lower, lower area. So the total cost that, that I see in putting in the lower Pacific Cove is approximately 89,000. And then um, I'm thinking that um, the lower Pacific Cove is only valuable to us once the numbers fill up on the upper Pacific Cove because you don't need it until it actually fills itself. So if you based on, if you base that your income um, being upper Pacific Cove today is at 80,000, you're, re you're receiving $80,000 in revenue a year for the upper Pacific Cove and you're going to have it open 90 days a year, you're only going to really come up with a revenue of 20, $20,000 a year, but I, you know, I, I expand myself. Let's, let's use 26000 a year. So the cost, the true cost to our general fund for that lower Pacific Cove, is, as it stands alone, is close to 72000 a year. Okay. And so Jamie and I discussed this a little bit. He gave me a little different scenario. If you look at the next page, and you took my, my figures and, and um, Jamie's looking at actually a loan reduction of just for Pacific Cove, and he's probably correct on this at 71,000 because if you took out the bathrooms, that really, bathrooms aren't say that's the parking area, but that's still still there. It's, we wouldn't have a bathrooms unless the parking lot was there, right? Or a park. Okay, then um, everything else is pretty much the same. And then when you get down to the revenue source, Jamie felt that we had a little higher revenue than I'm suggesting. And so he's still he's still showing even with his figures on this thing he's showing a deficit of about forty six thousand a year. I think somehow we need to narrow that 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 gap. I don't think we can afford to spend somewhere between seventy two forty six and seventy two thousand dollars a year on supporting that lower Pacific Cove. Um, I, I, I admittedly admittedly admit to that there's many other benefits beyond the cat the. Uh, the, the parking issue in that it relieves, um, it gives an opportunity in the, in the village to have property owners buy into the system. But that's a pretty big gap for us to carry, you know, that we're really not anticipating that, that hasn't been shown yet. That I would say that somewhere between the 72 and 46,000 a year that we have to anticipate in next year's budget is we're going to be carrying that money as long as that parking lot is there. I, I think that that's a very good point, and I think we discussed that last time, in, wherein 50 cents an hour is really ludicrous mm -hmm. for a parking meter program, and that um, it should be, you know, upper and lower should be twice what it is now at a dollar an hour, which is not unreasonable. Um, I think that, uh, by the way, this is very Kirby Nickel of you. I like this very much. <laughs> I, I, was, I was missing charts and, okay, pre-printed material. That's great. Uh, one of my heroes, Kirby. Um, I think that what we also have to keep in mind is that um, a parking program is not necessarily put in place to make money. A parking program is put in place to control parking, provide coastal access, and to reduce traffic. So that is the other benefit as well. And I agree with all those notions, and I um, uh, agree with all of the points that Dennis made, and I think it, we're going to find that the lower Pacific Cove is going to be more frequently used than upper Pacific Cove, just because of its, purely because of its elevation with regard to where we are. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Hopefully, we'll get cars out of the village, but I think that the village increase the Pacific Cove increase, the reduced cost in maintenance, I think everything. And by the way, this, um, this particular action by the council does, in fact, include the lower Pacific Cove bathrooms, correct? Yes, that was included in the scope of work for the... Right, good. Because whether we build a bathroom or not, there'll be a bathroom down there. So, yeah, um, yeah so that's it. Well, let, me, let me just stand yeah. back on your thoughts, Mike. Sure, and, sure. And that, that part of this discussion really should be, it, it, and I'm talking about narrowing this gap, Mm -hmm. and, and taking money from our general fund to support this parking lot. Um, we shouldn't be hesitant at all about raising the rates in the, in the village. Right. That should be a, a priority because if you want people to park up here, you've you got you to give them incentive to do that. And so we should be doubling the rates in the village. We should, we should be discussing that before summer comes. And we should also be discussing this idea of going from a two to a three hour. 
is when you hear the complaints, and Rudy hears more than, than all of us do, the major complaint is, is that their two hours expired. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have a disagreement even with the merchants that we should be in a three-hour program there. And so I, I, you know, I, I, um, maybe from this, the best thing that, that I can ask for is, is that, that we direct staff to bring back a program that looks at our parking meter rates, both in the uppers and in, in the village, and, and the possibility of going to the three hours. Yeah. Uh, agreed, and, and you know one of the one of the uh, rebuttals to three hours was that it, we were afraid it would limit or be perceived as limiting coastal access. When actually, I think we we have stand on firm ground going to three hours in the village, because we're providing 200 plus spaces for further coastal access in our lower Pacific Cove. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Nickel, Council Member Turney, the Norton. Nickel's not here anymore. That's Nick. Nickel slash Norton. It kind of looked okay. like Nick. I think right. the chart <laughs> threw him <laughs> off, Dennis. The chart threw him off. Right <laughs> Norton. Thank you, Jim. I apologize. Um, you recall that the parking meter rates, uh, our parking meter rates were established in our local coastal plan, which basically means that simple term is that the Coastal Commission had to approve any change to our coast parking meter rates. We submitted um, a request to the Coastal Commission to pull our rates out of the uh, coastal plan. They were scheduled to hear it last month. Um, the Coastal Commission deferred it and has instead punched it out till June. So before June, we really can't adjust our parking meter rates in any logical way. The times, however, we could bring that back to the next meeting if that would be something you'd like to do. Could we not could uh, vote to increase pending Coastal Commission approval? Um, oh, I caused the city manager some pain with that one. I, got, I, I, I sensed that. Can I interject here before you respond to that? I think the idea that Dennis brought up, and I think before we start increasing rates, there's a great suggestion here, and that is I think we should direct staff to, to direct to have some contact with the BIA and to direct the Parking Commission to come back to us with some rate proposals rather than us trying to figure out. I mean, the, the message was made clear that there's some revenue that can be gathered from the village. I, I, I right now, when you, when you said you want to double the rates in the village, I'm cringing because I, that's, that's going to cause a wave like we don't want to deal with. There's a lot of interested people between residents, BIA, and, and the members on the Parking Commission, and I think staff can bring us back a good report. So when we get around to June, when this becomes available, we can have a project that we can look at. And Dennis, I agree with you. You know, narrowing the gap here is, is where we need to go. And I know right now already that there's going to be, you know, $17,000 that we spent last year that we're not going to have to spend this year that can go towards this, but we're not into the budget process now. And this number of $46,000, although it may seem like it's there now, uh, you know, just because of the reduction of the loan, even though if you say you don't attribute it to that, these are revenue we're going to be saving as a result of the parking lot because that's where that loan comes from. So I, I think this $46,000 number is going to be absorbed, and I think that the ultimate goal is here. We are trying to, with an experiment, to see if we can take the chokehold off the village with the parking and, and the circulation, and that's the goal. And like I said, as, as far as parking rate, I, when that gets lifted in June, which we anticipate it will, we anticipate it will? Yes, we do. Yeah, then I think we're wide open, but I think we should have staff and other agencies that, that we work for us, like the Parking Commission and the BIA, Give us some input about that. No, I'm fine with that. I just we're, we're burying this in bureaucracy again. Okay. But that's, I, you know, I, I I agree that that that's probably the the rifle form. My point is is that that we should be ready to do this the day we open that parking lot. Yes. We should, and we near, need to narrow that gap. And there is no mechanism there now Ed, to to narrow that gap. Now, if you really want to talk about what no, normal jurisdictions do, they, what they do, they they form this thing called the assessment district. And what it is, is if you go downtown Santa Cruz and you're a property owner down there, you pay, to, you pay for that parking. Are we asking the, the merchants in the village to pay one penny for it? No. The public, the people in these neighborhoods are paying for the parking for them. And, and the gap is still there. So this is just something we should discuss. But we have to have to come back with some ideas on that. Yeah, my, oh. yeah mm -hmm. and, and I, think you're, I think the method's fine if you want to do that. It's just that we should be ready to do this the day that parking lot opens. I agree. Steve, what's your best guess on the parking lot opening? <laughs> oh, I knew it was going to come down to this, didn't you, Steve? <laughs> By the festivals. <laughs> By the festival, the Art and Wine and the Begonia Festivals. End of the summer. End of the summer. Oh. After the festivals? No. Oh, you think it's going to be open before the festivals? Well, that's her goal. We're going to try. Really? We're going to try. For you. Yeah. Now, that was, now, these figures are with 50 cents an hour down below, correct? Correct. Can we go to a, a dollar without going to the Coastal Commission? No. 
because that 50 cents was in that, that report. It's in our LCP right okay. now. All our rates are, and actually we can't put meters down there until we amend, because that's not in a meter zone. So we need to amend our meter areas and then, uh, which we'll be able to do without going to the Coastal Commission once these actions have been taken. So in June, we can come back and amend the meter areas and the rates. So could we recommend that the staff comes back to us within 60 days? And that gives time for both the BIA and the, and the Traffic and Circulation Committee to look at it and the staff to make a recommendation. Reason? We need to wait until after they've come back. We don't know what their decision is going to be. Well, no, I think no, we can, we can it discuss it I, and saying. be ready, can't we, for when the Coastal Commission makes its final determination? You certainly could have a hearing about it in advance of June. My recommendation is my concern would be that we would be having sort of hearings in advance of hearings, that, that we do do the work in advance uh, with the BIA, with the Parking and Traffic Commission, so that once the Coastal Commission has approved it, we're ready to go. I can I can suggest that the hours discussion is something that we have complete flexibility on today, mm -hmm. uh, and we can come back as soon as the council would like and have the discussion about hours. Doesn't the two-hour limit isn't that part of our LCP as well? No, it's not. Really? Yeah. So we have flexibility about that, and we could have a hearing about that. And in fact. Uh, I believe we may be bringing an item simply to consolidate because the, uh, the, the, the restrictions on how long you can park in any individual space is stored in a number of different documents in different locations in the city. And as part of this effort that we've been doing internally, uh, we thought we could do a cleanup of that and bring it all into consolidate into one place. Or we could do the di complete discussion of ours. We can do that at the next meeting. We could do that in a month. Uh, I just need to hear from the council about the priority of that, or if you want to bundle it with the the rates discussion. I feel better about bundling it all. Yeah, I think one it should be bundled in. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, 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 get, let's get the Parking Commission and the BIA hot on this right away. Let's don't sit here and wait. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Well, in the past, been there's, there's been a lot of pushback to go to three hours because they wanted the turnover. So we'll see what the thought is now about, about that. Because we've talked about this many, many times, and we've stayed at the two hours because the merchants we, said we, we want to stay at that. We cannot, because we have a lot of responsibilities here, and uh, I have to push back a little bit on the BIA because I could recite their response for you right now ahead of them even hearing about this. I think we all can. They've changed. We'll see. Okay. But I want to tell you, we cannot have the merchants dictate how we regulate coastal access in this community, period. It is the, the Coastal Act. It is our beaches, it is the city in general, and it is our entire community. We, are, we cannot be driven solely by the desires of merchants. I just want their input. I don't want them to dictate. Right. I think we just take input from all those sources, ultimately. No, the uh, agreed. And, and that's important. It's a democratic process. Right. I'm saying that it's, we have to make sure we focus on what our priorities are. And so what we will end up doing, because we have been doing this work, we will end up coming back and we'll just put it on consent, but consolidating all of the, the uh, our restrictions into a single document, just, just because when we've gone through and done the research, it's been a little disorganized, and I think it would be most beneficial to the city to do that. And we won't be proposing any changes in it, but we'll just put it on consent for one of our coming meetings. Sam. And, yeah, just a point of clarification about the Santa Cruz County uh, loan. The refinancing is going through the iBank, correct? Or no, no we're refinancing our note, uh, which was a $2.4 million note with Santa Cruz County Bank, and we are refinancing that uh, to a lower rate and a tax-exempt note. The financing for the, the Lower Pacific Cove Improvement Project is coming from the iBank, and that's, again, a tax-exempt rate, uh, and it's for the one37 uh, million dollar project, which is basically the improvements that we've planned today in right. Lower Pack Cove and a few improvements in Upper Pack Cove. Well, I guess I was because in the staff report it refers to I Bank funding proposal, and it one of the line items is refinancing 2.39 million dollar debt with San Cruz County Bank. See on the page I 53. I think what that was intended, uh, yes, I think what that was intended to do was kind of show a comprehensive budget for all the different actions we're sort of taking okay. in conjunction with Pacific Cove. Council member 
Norton was pulling out some of the un items unrelated to the construction of the lot. For example, the refinancing, as Dennis pointed out, could take place regardless of whether we did the iBank loan or built the parking okay. lot. And that, that was Dennis's point. Um, but, but no, we, we, are, we are refinancing with a local bank, uh, that existing note. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that we have a program that's going to work for the public so we don't get in trouble like we did before because we had parking banks before and people couldn't find them and um, then they would come back, to, they finally found it and then they would come back to their car and, and you know, have a ticket on it. And it was a very unfriendly program. I, I don't, it was kind of a ex grand experiment. So I just want to make sure that you know, this is something that's really usable, fr user friendly for people. And I also don't like all the signs in the village and the clutter that we have. And you know, have to, to, you know, we have to have a certain amount of information there, but um, that we just need to be really careful about that, that it doesn't end up looking too junky because we have these machines and we have signs or we have... We just start taking you know, down some of the meter poles. Yeah, here. we're actually looking at a way to replace the signage that's there on all the old meter poles that then will enable us to eliminate every other meter we're hopeful. Um, we're working on that right now. Uh, Eddie Ray Garcia is, is looking at a different type of sign that we can put on one that will be legible from all three or all the way around the, the, the meter pole. Then we'll eliminate some of those down there. Either that or more landscaping or something <coughs> yeah, just to make it still really attractive. And if the sign's not at waste level, the signs are yeah. a, uh, a, a danger. Right. You, you, know, know, we, you, know, you know what we need is, you know how you drive into Yosemite and they have their own radio station? You drive into Capitola Village and it directs you to Pacific Cove. It tells you where the parking banks are. It, every, all the pain within, if you park in the village. Is yeah, we could put, uh, you know, on, on behalf Somebody of Marilyn, who's the radio not here tonight, we, we, we need more transmission of radio waves more because I think, Marilyn, I think Marilyn would appreciate that. She didn't make it to a public comment tonight. Okay, enough direction. Do we want a motion on anything? I think there's a motion and a second. Motion and a second. Yes. It's on, it's on the floor. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm curious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next item is 9C, receive Good informational work. report on <laughs> firearms in consideration of a letter of support for Senate Bill 53 pertaining to ammunition purchase this permits. Thank you for tough. putting this on the agenda. You're welcome. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Rudy Escalante, your Chief of Police. Over the last few months, uh, we have done a lot of research and actually had a urgency ordinance that was passed back on February 28th where we updated our firearms ordinance, which is Capitol Municipal Code 5.32. Uh, since that time, I just want to give you a little update as to what we've been doing uh, locally. We have updated our website, trying to encourage residents about gun ownership and gun safety and that they can uh, actually get a gun lock or they can turn their guns in for free here at the department if they have you know, a, a firearm that has kind of been laying around the house for uh, many, many years and they want to get rid of it. So for those in the audience uh, who are watching tonight, if you have a situation like that, come on down. We would be happy to take that off your hands. Uh, we also give you free gun locks. Uh, from a county perspective, the County Chiefs Association has met several times, uh, myself and the sheriff and other chiefs, and we are actually moving forward with an amnesty program. We've got a couple potential possible dates next month. We've identified some locations, so we're actually moving forward with that and trying to work out the logistics so that uh, that will be put on safely. Uh, the challenges with that are to make sure people don't walk up with firearms, as you can imagine. Uh, the other a potential conflict is trying to do it at a location where there's no weekend activities, there's no schools, no daycare centers. So there's a lot of moving pieces in that that we have to pay consider, considerable amount of attention to. But we are moving forward with that. Um, from a, another county perspective, our CJC council has been talking about looking at a potential buyback if that's something that we wanted to do within Santa Cruz County. Again, that would probably have to be at a couple of different locations. Logistically, that would have to be worked out, and also the financial piece, because that usually comes from a private donor that's not funded by local government. Uh, as far as some bills, just so you know, uh, yeah, I am a member of the California Police Chiefs Association. Of all the members in the state, I sit on the Law and Legislative Committee, and I am assigned all the bills to monitor them in the state uh, regarding firearms and ammunition. 
I have a large task, as you can see in front of me. I have 33 bills that I monitor. And part of the looking after those bills is to kind of look at what the amendments are, try to look at each one of them, and try to anticipate what some of the issues might be. I'm in contact with staffers from the Assembly and the Senate uh, talking about their bills because they're obviously looking for the California Chiefs Association uh, support on their bills. We meet every other week by conference call, so we discuss these bills. Uh, we, we support, we watch them, or we may oppose them in principle. And part of the reason for that is there may not be a law enforcement exemption. There is a bill out where they're proposing to tax every single piece of ammunition that's sold. But the problem is there's no exemption for law enforcement there. And so that would really be a budget problem for several agencies, especially the larger agencies uh, or agencies that have SWAT teams and they have to train on a regular basis. So we try to work with them, and that's my job, and that's what I, uh, I monitor all those bills not only for the Chiefs Association, but you as a council. I also am on the uh, Firearms Committee for the state, meaning that it's my responsibility to assist in writing the policy statement for the Police Chiefs Association. So I'm very much connected up and down the state with the firearms policies that are going on. So I can keep you appraised of those. Uh, one recommendation that I have in my staff report is to direct staff to send a letter in support of Senate Bill 53 by Senator DeLeon. Uh, just uh, some information about that bill is they want to regulate ammunition by making people get a permit to buy ammunition. The permit would be similar to that as purchasing a firearm. You would go through a background check, you would be issued a card for a period of time, and when you bought ammunition, if you not only would get the 10-day clearance for your firearm, then you'd get clearance to buy the ammunition as well. Uh, as you know, we've had recently a, a case where a person accidentally fired a weapon in their car, it went off and they shot themselves. That person was a convicted felon, and they were able to purchase ammunition that day. So that is, this is a law that the California Chiefs Association strongly supports, and uh, that's something that we're following through with, and I think it's a good bill looking at it, and so it would be my recommendation that we uh, send a letter of support there. The other bill that is in my uh, staff report is Assembly Bill 1296 by Assemblywoman Skinner, and uh, that is redefining... Uh, some of the uh, armed prohibited persons list and requirements. So basically, if you make a statement to a psychotherapist that you are going to harm somebody, and right now you would be prohibited for six months from purchasing a firearm, they're looking at extending that to five years. If, you, if a person was uh, committed on a 72-hour hold and that information goes to the Department of Justice, currently it's a five-year prohibition. They're looking at extending that in this bill to 10 years. So this is another bill that we have from a perspective of Cal Chiefs Association are supporting. Uh, again, there's 31 other bills that we're looking at, uh, some of them that we uh, still haven't made a decision on. We're still watching to see what changes might be made. Uh, some of these will be going to the Public Safety Committee, and there will be hearings on those. I anticipate attending uh, Sacramento on the floor when these hearings go, so I will continually keep you updated as needed. Thank you. Chief, um, I know that everyone who purchases a handgun has to be licensed. Do they also need to be licensed to purchase a long gun? There's, there's a difference between that, and actually in the ammunition laws right now, it's 21 to purchase handgun ammunition, 18 for a shotgun or long gun ammunition. Right. That is actually, it used to be where you did not have to, but now you do. Now, I'm looking at what I'm, what I'm trying to go to ours is we seem to be creating a really huge bureaucracy and additional licensing level where wouldn't it just make sense, and I'm sure making sense in Sacramento is not exactly a priority, but um, to be able to produce your, your license to own a firearm in order to purchase ammunition. A lot of it is they want people to go through the background check because you can only, you have to wait a certain amount of period before you buy your next firearm. Right. So what happens is in the event during that time period a person gets arrested or they get involved in something, Got they it. want them to continually go through the background check so they pick anything new up. And, and I'll tell you, the only thing, I, I, I appreciate everything you're saying about the 10 years, about the, the one year, you know, and the, the, the prohibitions against the firearms. 
my concern is, and, and I'll be in favor of this, but my big concern is that the, the vast majority of gun um, violent atrocities that have taken place take place from illegally obtained firearms. Well, in other words, the person who did the, 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 the mass murders in Connecticut stole someone else's guns and did it, and it's just frustrating because we can pass all the laws in the world, and someone's going to illegally obtain a gun and do something. It's daunting. One of the perspectives Cal Chiefs is taking is education and safety. Uh, on an annual year, approximately 300,000 firearms are purchased and about 100,000 are stolen annually in the state of California. Yeah. So there are quite a few that are stolen, obviously, and get used in an inappropriate way. And so we are trying to look at ways that we can increase safety and increase, and increase education on how to handle firearms so that we can reduce accidental shootings. There's several that happen with kids that find weapons that are not properly stored and then for also those that are uh, stolen as well. Can we promote accidental shootings by felons on themselves? <laughs> okay, just, just a rhetorical question. I have nothing else. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this item? Good evening. Come right up, sign in. Sure. Good evening, Mayor Harlan and Capitola City Council. Um, thanks for the opportunity to make a few comments about, uh, specifically about SB 53, but in general about gun violence too. I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on, on the bill, but before I start, I wanted to uh, update you on a statistic that I recited uh, last time I addressed the, the City Council. And Can that I give us your name, please? Oh, my name is Jerry Totes. Thanks. Sorry, excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. The last time I addressed the City Council, um, I was quoting from a, a demographic uh, that's kept by uh, Slate.com with the collaboration of at gun deaths. And what they do is they tally the number of people that have died through uh, gun fire uh, nationwide, and then they break it down demographically. Um, and they start from this uh, watershed date, December 14th, when the Newtown tragedy happened. So there's been 118 days that have elapsed since then, and 3,370 gunfire deaths have happened in the United States since then. In our state, in California, there have been 392. So that's better than three lives ended every day. They even break it down demographically by age. Um, of those 392, 30 teenagers in the state of California died by gunfire and one child. So we're only talking about the first uh, third of the year. So it beho behooves us to really consider this issue seriously. Um, we've been wrestling with how to deal with this issue for decades. Um, there was a landmark uh, gun bill passed in the uh, in the federal legislature in 1968 called the uh, Gun Control Act. And at that time, they did deal with ammunition. And the history is that uh, ammunition was controlled just as firearms were controlled. Uh, the purpose of the uh, Gun Control Act, um, if I might read it, was stated in a report prepared by a legislative attorney, Vivian Chu, for the legislature. Um, the purpose of the Gun Control Act of 1968 was to keep firearms out of the hands of those not legally entitled to possess them because of age, criminal background, or incompetency, and to assist law enforcement authorities in the states and their subdivisions in combating the increasing prevalence of crime in the United States. That mission is still very much important for us, and we should continue to try to pursue that. The history, though, is that in 1986, the Firearm Owners Protection Act was passed, which reversed all of the oversight that was in place for ammunition. So at that time, in 1986, 
purchase of ammunition was completely free form, as it is today. Ammunition can be purchased by anyone, from anyone, with no record of sale whatsoever. So we're dealing with a big hole in, I think, a very good fabric of laws in California. We do have what's in place uh, to track <coughs> an expanded list of people who are pro prohibited from owning firearms. We have a list of people that we know felons and, uh, and people who have identified themselves or have been identified as having um, severe mental handicaps. But also in the state of California, the prohibited persons list includes certain violent misdemeanor uh, violations, violators of certain laws that, that prove themselves to be violent, as well as uh, juveniles. juveniles. Juveniles in the state of California who fall under criti uh, violent criminal categories are prohibited from owning firearms until they're age 30. So looking at the, uh, at the studies, we know that a lot of firearm uh, uh, violations are committed by these individuals, people who have committed violent misdemeanors and um, people who have exhibited violence in, in their youth. And um, Your three minutes is over. Can you summarize a little bit? Oh, sure. I didn't know I was timed. Well, anyway, um, the... The purpose of my uh, visit tonight is to ask you and to uh, encourage uh, you to send a uh, message of endorsement on SB 53, which would deal with uh, ammunition purchases, freeform ammunition purchases. And the best way to do that, I think, at this time would be to send your uh, endorsement to the um, Senate Public Safety Chairperson, Lonnie Hancock, Senator Lonnie Hancock and then uh, copy the author's office, uh, Senator Kevin DeLeon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this issue? <coughs> Hello again. Hello, this is the, <coughs> the second other reason why I came for this. I w uh, most of you know that I'm a nurse. That's no big thing. But I also spent 29 years as an active reservist and retired at the rank of full colonel. And for a long time, they told us that you hold up your Geneva Convention card and they won't shoot you. And then they said, uh, after a while, they realized the insanity of that. And they said, they're going to shoot them. So they said, we better take them out and teach them how to protect themselves. Clearly, you cannot keep guns out of the hands of criminals. And if what everybody was worried about was the death of children and the loss of lives, we would stop issuing liquor licenses and we would crack down on drunk driving because by far that is where the major deaths occur. And it's illegal to do it all and you can't stop it. And the fact that everybody jumped on this bandwagon, and I think it was tragic what happened, but all you have done with what you have done is make the firearms license down here at Big Five worth a whole lot more because you've, you've created that. And you get busy and you do this and we create some more laws. And I think, I think it's just a real travesty that we hop on this bandwagon and like I said, we let drunk drivers and we encourage people to come here and eat and drink. And so we have some sorely misplaced values. And uh, you know, it is a, the law-abiding citizens who own guns should be left alone. We should focus on getting the hands out of criminals and enforcing the laws that we have. We should also enforce, <coughs> we, we, we need to come to grips with how we manage the mentally ill. As long as you allow them not to take their medication and to walk around on the street amongst us, we have a problem. And those things don't jive. So there, you know, there are a whole lot of big issues here but you are expending a lot of energy at the expense of people who abide by every law, but who will suddenly be in violation with some of this that you're trying to do. So I would encourage you not to support these insane things that the state of California comes up with and do something like support expending our energy on drunk driving passing more laws that get them off the street, the things that really matter, because the criminals will always have guns. They will steal them. 
So, thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak on this? Then I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. I'll move uh, staff recommendation and note that um, although that I have no doubt that you will need to produce proper identification and be licensed to purchase ammunition in the state of California, that if you hop in your car with or without a driver's license, drunk or sober, and drive to Nevada for three hours, you can buy a truckload of ammunition. So I'll move the staff recommendation. Are you moving both? Uh, uh, both? Uh, yes, um, please. S SP 53 and yes. AB 12. Okay, I'll second that motion. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'd just like to add one, one, one follow-up to Sandy. Is the majority of the people in this country, particularly California, support increased laws governing guns and ammunition in the state of California. Yep. So that's, that's an action that we would follow. And we should be careful of statistics because we can make anything sound good with statistics. And I read an, an interesting one. Because of the number of guns in the country, a gun buyback program, and the number of deaths caused by guns, you would have to buy back 10,000 guns to prevent a single death because only a single death occurs per 10,000 guns, which has less to do with gun violence and more to do with the number of guns in the country. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go back to item 7 for just a moment that I skipped over by mistake, and I'd like to appoint Al Carlton to as his capital as appointment to the Advisory Council on the Area Agency of Aging, the also commonly called the Advisory Council. You don't Al need Carlson or Al Carlson? Oh. Carlson. Yeah. Carlson. Oh, he's yeah. Great. And he's willing to he's willing to serve. And, Fantastic. And you you don't need to a motion or anything on that. That's no, just I'm your just appointment. Do it, yeah. yeah. It'll take a lot of fishing Very time good. away from Al. I think I'm worried about that, but that's okay. <laughs> the next item is item D, consideration of approval of the revised cellular telephone use policy. And Larry, Larry, you're up late tonight. Yeah, wow. Sorry you had to right, wait don't, so long. Don't tell the kids. Good evening, Mayor Good evening. and Council Members. Um, I'm here to just kind of go over, we, we made a couple revisions to our cellular phone policy. And I'd like to actually not call it cellular phone policy because it, uh, these are now really computers in your pocket, computers, I mean, they do everything. And we needed to address some of those issues. Um, one of the main things we did is um, in this, we would like to inf install what they call um, mobile device management, which allows the IT department and all of the IT department to be able to manage a phone as they do a computer. If one of the concerns we have, or I have, is if a phone is lost, stolen, or if someone leaves, we currently our only mechanism for getting rid of city data is to wipe that phone clean. There are problems with that, is that we, that would be personal data as well as city data. One of the things the mobile dev device management allows us to do is segregate that data. We can say, okay, this is data that is city derived and this is data that's personally derived and I can then control it and be able to remove that piece of data. The other thing is, is that with, with the amount of things on, on the phones and the, and the cellular devices now, we have to almost treat them as computers and we, we, we have to manage them as such, um, you know, we, we we have data on there that, you know, police records, those, uh, all sorts of information that probably never, we never thought of we'd have on there because people are getting access to things everywhere. So that's kind of where w the main focus of what we're trying to change with this policy. Um, is there any questions regarding I, I have a question. Mike. Yes. I, I appreciate and understand your concern. Uh -huh. But on the other end of it, and I'm not in favor of this particular expenditure, only because everything on uh, city cell phones is subject to public information. All of this information is public to begin with, so it really is irrelevant whether we monitor and protect it. Well, well but don't, if, if it is city information, doesn't someone have to come in and request that? What I don't want is someone getting hold of a device and getting information that may not be part of that, it, uh, police information? It's irrelevant. If it's on the cell phone, it is totally um, discoverable. Our, our, personal, our personal information as well as the public, and we've been informed that everything we have, all communications, is public information. Well, and I don't yeah. see where there's any proprietary, unless there are police um, smartphones that have information that is not, in fact, subject to public record and I'll defer to the to the city attorney and city manager. 
Uh, Council Member Termini, all, all the privileges still apply. So if you had, for instance, a communication with me on your cell phone, that would be protected by the attorney-client privilege. Um, <coughs> all of those things would still apply. So not everything that is on your mobile device is a public record, even if it's a city device. But what about, uh, uh, what I was thinking of is, you know, and I understand and I appreciate, Larry, you know, you paying attention to this because it is true we're carrying a lot more around now. But, yeah. um, are we being overly cautious and spending money to be overly cautious? And, and every time you're overly cautious, you make the mechanism more complex. I have, I have, I have no intentions to do that. What, uh, what my major concern, I mean, I would, I would do this on city-owned devices. Regard this, the main, because we do this with desktops. We do this with laptops. These are just basic tools. The truth is, with BlackBerry, it was built in. Now we're having to, you know, as far as these controls, um, now I have to get a, a system that allows me to talk to Apple, Android, Microsoft phone, if we ever see one around, um, <laughs> all, the, all those things. Does um, anyone buy Androids anymore? Does, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. And it, it's just, a, it, it's, for me, it's a minimal control. We have antivirus on computers. We, you know, we, we put security on file servers. They're really just computers out there. This tool also allows me to do things like deploy applications. Uh, control, fix um, Wi-Fi. You know, I can I can push this out. If we have to change a, a code on a Wi-Fi that someone gets to within the city, I can change that in one place and have it push out. Uh, those are. But the, my major concern was to get something on here that, if especially on what they call a, a bring your own device, mm -hmm. that I don't have to. If some if something happens to it, I don't have to wipe that thing clean of someone's personal as well as pri uh, city data. I can say, okay, this is. The piece of, these are the pieces of information that we, we provide as a city for them to have access to. I can say, okay, this is the stuff I, I don't want to have. What um, sort of things in, in 50 devices are we concerned about? Because surely they're not all police records. Uh, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time with it. I, I just, the, the, what I'm looking at is uh, this, to me, this is, these are computers. I, this is a, I don't, I can't put the same level of physical security on, a, on this that I can on a computer here. It's it's just, to me, it's just basic. The, the, fortunately, it's management tools that aren't included in the software anymore. Like I said, I can wipe these things clean with, with no, but I want to make sure that I have uh, the ability to, 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 if someone loses, I can put a new lock code on it. Just, just this is like the, the, the base things. I, I don't want to get in people's way of doing things. That's not what I, I intend to do. I just want to make sure that because these are city devices and, and because Part of my job is trying to secure data. <laughs> I want to make sure I have a tool available to me. Okay. I, I, I know that it's, in, in city speak, $2,400 a year is not a lot of money, but yet it is a lot of money. Well, and, and I think that, you know, we could spend $5,000 a year and someone in their second year of middle school can probably get into any of the cell phones they want, but that's just... Y y there's, there's, there's always, and that's why we're using a system that they... There's someone working on it. These are this. This is a, a live system. It is a system. It's a software as a service. We 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 are they. If they find holes and and things, they do deploy it. So as I. And just a quick quick question yes. of clarification, Larry. Yes. The system that you're talking about putting on, I'm going to call it a phone for right now. Yeah. Then, I'm, then in a minute I'm going to call it a computer. Mm -hmm. The system you have right now, you already have it on all the computers in the city. Well, it, not the exact same. But the yeah, similar, I, I have similar, similar, absolutely. So absolutely. all we're doing is because we're going to call the phone a computer, you want to expand that to those devices. I want to have the ability to, to secure them. That device. It, and it, only it, because it, we're not going to call it a phone anymore because it is essentially a computer. It is essentially a computer. That's right. So, so it's all, something we're already doing to the other devices. Absolutely. We're just adding absolutely. it to and, cover. And, and the reality is these have, because these are out of our physical location, it, there's there's more issues involved. And what expense do we p spend right now to put on the devices? Well, we, we pay software, li you know, uh, operating system licenses. We pay um, for the servers, for um, pay antivirus and anti-spam licenses, which per device, I don't know, 15 to 20 a year, okay. something like that. Um, but to get the the phone the phone slash computers into the process is four dollars a device. Four dollars a device month. So it's it and we they're about or fifty devices. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to be clear also that t today we're not.
we're not talking about the expenditure. Uh, I believe Larry has that expenditure already budgeted in his budget. What we're talking about tonight is, is amending our, um, our mobile device policy that basically authorizes Larry to put this software on everybody's phone. Are the council members considered everybody? You, you don't access our, the, the main thing, you don't access the, the email resources and, the, and that sort of resource. You're using the Wi-Fi, but you're not getting to the email system. Okay. So this includes the whole police department then, too? Yes, and they, all their phones are, are city-owned. So we would be doing that re regardless. It, it, like I said, this is mainly a change on the, what they call the bring-your-own-device, bring your personal ones. If they do access city resources, that's, that, that's kind of where this was going. Or when someone retires, you'd say, give me your phone so I can yeah. erase all the I'm more stuff. concerned with people that don't leave on the best of terms. You know, people, it's easy. People that leave on the best terms, we, we, we go through the process. But if someone is here today and gone tomorrow and, you know, that sort of thing, that's, that's kind of my concern. You're starting to sell me. Yeah. I just, so this is particular to... Uh, staff who bring in their own phones. It's go it's going to okay. go on all the city-owned phones, but this this is particular to those who bring on their get a stipend to access the data, right. bring in their iPad to to access the data. That's for city-owned phones. What's the <coughs> concern about the separation of city data and personal data? I, well, if 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 the phone if if Someone leave? That, no, that's actually not my concern with that, the city okay. phone. That's so absolutely not. That's my, not. No, that's no, that's not my an concern issue. is on the personal phones. It's okay, so it's the personal that, phones. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. That this policy is relevant to. That's the, the primary focus. And so, when people bring in their own phones, is theoretically it saves the city money because we're not having to provide that. So they, um, they, well, we have the expense. stipend program for that, so um, they do use that phone for other purposes as well. We're not, we're not buying them the phone, mm -hmm. and we're not paying for the service. Okay. I have another concern about the last item on this policy, and that the employees are fully cognizant mm -hmm. of the privacy paragraph. I don't know if anyone's read it. That the city will not guarantee any right to privacy for any part of their personal phone, including call records, voice logs, voicemails. So the, the employees need to understand that they have exposed all of their personal text and voice communications to the city. But what, I, what I plan to do is we're going to have each person with that personal device sign to make sure that they understand that. But, but what I want to be clear about this is when using a city-issued device, so that's... Oh, well that's really right, different. Right. Or when conducting city of Capitola business on a personal device then there's no right to privacy. So in other words, if I'm conducting business on my phone, those documents are public record. And I think that the courts have made that abundantly clear at this point. What this doesn't say is if I'm using this on a weekend to watch the baseball game, that doesn't, I haven't waived any right to privacy to that. Is that? We'll see. <laughs> well, for now. For, for now. now. But, you know, I, I think that's a, that, that's a fair estimation for any computers, you know, unfortunately. Other questions? Thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this topic? Okay, then I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Other questions or comments? I have no questions. No questions. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to, uh, to pass this. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Motion passes. That um, leads us to council uh, comments. Um, I, I'm sorry. I pulled oh, item. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay um, we're going to go back to the consent calendar to item 8A. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, um, we, through some confusion, we, we passed an urgency ordinance the other day on, on the gun control issue. And there was a lot of discussion that went on, and, I, and there was things taken out and put back in. And when I read the minutes of it, I'm not clear that this is exactly what we approved. So if we could take a look at that page. Yes. That's page number six. Um, it was my understanding that all, all the gun sale permits would be required for new stores have to come to council level. Is that, did we agree that? Yes. I don't see that in here. 
I'm not sure that this is the entire ordinance. The text of the ordinance made that clear. Okay. Um, These were the revisions. These were the changes, I think. The changes on top of the changes. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, it, what might, might help us is if maybe um, when we do this kind of discussion, particularly when we're really ripping and tearing, is that it comes back to us in a whole to see exactly what we did prove, Jamie. I, I'm really a little lost. There's something in here that I have a question about that I, I remember discussion about it, but I didn't, I didn't know that we included it in here. And I'll, and I'll give you the example of this. Um, um, firearm dealers, including all businesses that sell, lease, transfers, advertise, or exposes, uh, or exposes for sale, lease, or transfer of any firearm or ammunition or firearm. And it, what's crossed out here is ammunition for firearm. I didn't know that we eliminated that from that. From that. Well, because we found out that there was no, we were we were preempting because there's no requirement for anybody to be licensed to sell ammunition. Okay. You can buy it at the grocery store. And we made that part of our motion. Is there anybody in Capitol Toll that sells ammunition that isn't a gun dealer? There's there's a couple of fishing tackle there's stores that actually sell okay. ammunition. Okay. Okay. But it, what, what would help me is if we could come back with a copy of the full ordinance just for as a consent item or something that shows exactly what we approved of this because sure. we did we did rip and tear at it. So we usually do that as the second reading of the ordinance, mm -hmm. and we usually put that on consent, uh, with which you'll have the full and complete text. And that's coming back when? That came back at the following meeting after this? It did? It, it, it did. So, oh. It was the urgency. No, ordinance. not the urgency ordinance. And you right. changed it on the screen. Right. Right. So, okay. So with the urgency ordinance, uh, we'd be happy to we'll all distribute it to the council members tonight. But, but thank you for correcting me. Yes, urgency ordinances do not require a second reading. So for every other ordinance that we pass, we do bring it back for a second reading where you'd have that opportunity. Um, I'll get you a copy of the final ordinance. And it was it was codified the way it appeared on the screen that evening. Thank you. Want to make a motion on this one? Move item uh, 8A of the consent. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The uh, last item is just we have a revised agenda tonight because we have an item 12 that just is additional materials. And it was the various emails that we had on our desk. So we all got copies of that. And are there any other uh, council uh, comments? Any other treasurer comments? I'd like to uh, thank Jeremy Totes for coming out tonight. He sat through the whole meeting for us. And yeah. I appreciate Wherever it. He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Okay. Any other staff comments? Then thank you very much. We're adjourned.